Good morning. It is December 12th. I am Council President Andrew Friedson. We're here for a council session. Uh, we will begin with general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? Good morning, Mr. President. We have one announcement that has been added to the agenda in the district council session that we'll get to later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. The minutes from the council meeting on November 27th were circulated to colleagues for approval. Are there any objections to approving these minutes? Seeing none, these minutes stand approved. We will now receive an update from the uh, executive branch on the county's fiscal condition and position based on current revenue and expenditure ex uh, assumptions. Mr. Howard uh, has joined us from council staff and we'll ask that our colleagues from the executive branch from finance and OMB to join us as well. And with that, let me turn it over to you, Mr. Howard. And I'll just note, uh, we're gonna employ the five minute rule for questions after the presentation. Uh, but first, uh, we'll ask council staff and the executive branch to uh, share with us the information. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mr. President and council members. <clears throat> uh, before I begin, I want to thank, um, as always, finance and OMB staff for working uh, diligently to put all this information together in a short period of time. Um, so we can have this update before the council goes on recess. Uh, their work is always appreciated. I also want to thank Mr. Ambinder from the council staff who helped prepare uh, the information that's put together in the packet. So I'm going to walk through the uh, fiscal plan update memo um, that's, in, that's in the staff report um, and kind of go over, start by going over some of the big picture highlights of what's included in the fiscal plan update and then do a little bit more on some of the particular revenue and expenditure items then allow, uh, we can allow finance and OMB to make any additional comments they would like to make and, and turn it back over to the council for questions and discussion. So each year in June, the council approves a fiscal plan that projects revenues, expenditures, and reserves over a six year period. And this is based on the budget that you approved the, the previous May. The fiscal plan is then updated two different times. Uh, the first is the December update, which we are doing today. Um, and then there's also an update in March that uh, accompanies the executive's recommended operating budget. The fiscal plan pre presents an overview of the county's fiscal picture at a particular point in time, so it's important to remember that, that things um, can and do change between now and March, just as they've changed between uh, June and um, today. So overall, from the big picture, the um, good news that's in the updated fiscal plan is that the fiscal position for ending FY23 um, ended up higher than projected based on revenue collections that were above what was um, projected as part of the, the approved budget. Um, total tax revenues in FY23 were $229.7 million greater than budgeted. This allowed the county to end FY23 with general fund reserves at an estimated 16.8% which is an increase over the 14.1% reserve level that was assumed as part of the, the budget approval and also as well above the 10% policy level for our reserves. Additionally, updated estimates for FY24 are also showing better than anticipated total revenues estimated at $225.2 million above the level that you approved um, as part of the budget last May. There's also some slightly less positive news um, going forward. And that is that the revised fiscal plan uh, does continue, show continued economic uncertainty and maintains a projection of a mild recession that was first incorporated into the fiscal plan last year, um, albeit with a delayed start date to the recession. Previously, the re recession was assumed to start in uh, calendar year 2023. Now it's projected to start in calendar year 2024. Aside from the additional uh, revenue projected in FY24, the projected total revenues in FY25 through 29 do not vary substantially from what was projected last June. So those are essentially um, staying the same in line with the, um, the general economic conditions projection. Um, but also of note, the state did announce um, significant cuts to transportation funding um, at the state level. So we'll have to see how that impacts the county budget going forward um, and also whether there are um, additional impacts on the overall state budget. So that's um, another piece of news just to kind of be aware of and, and see what happens going forward. The overall impact of the projected revenue changes, the actual revenue changes in FY23 and projected changes in FY24 will essentially be a large influx of one-time revenue to the county that the executive and the council will need to address um, in alignment with the county's fiscal policies, which state that one-time revenues should be used for one-time expenditures. 
And the chart on page um, two of the staff report shows the FY24 to 29 uh, tax, tax reported revenues, both the approved fiscal plan in June and the fiscal plan update in December. And you can see that in the out years, there's very little change between what was projected and what we are now projecting. But the change does, there's a significant increase in the FY24 numbers. So each year when we talk about the fiscal plan, we talk about both the, the uh, unknown factors and the known factors that could affect these estimates as we, as we move into March. So in terms of what's unknown, uh, the State Board of Revenue Estimates is scheduled to present an update on their economic forecast on Thursday, December 14th. Um, so that will be the first opportunity to see whether some of the impacts we're seeing on the transportation area of the state uh, funding is also potentially impacting uh, other areas of the state budget. Of course, the February 24 income tax distribution will be really important, as well as the revisions to the assessable base uh, that each one third of the county is reassessed each year, um, and those reassessments come out in January. And obviously, the speed and scope of a potential recession is still unknown. Um, it seems that there is kind of a yo-yo effect every time you look at the economic news. Um, some days everything looks good. The next days you see you know, bad indicators or, or less good indicators. So um, what happens there will have an impact on our, our resources going forward. There are also several known factors that will need to be incorporated into the FY25 um, budget process when the executive submits his budget and when the council reviews it. First, we have the annualization of FY24 pay adjustments and new positions. Uh, for county government, this was estimated to be about $33 million during the budget process. So these are dollars that will need to be incorporated into the FY25 budget. There's potential reductions in the state transportation funding that we know about. We just don't know quite the, the scale and scope of those, um, as well as if there's any other um, state funding impacts. Whatever the changes to MCPS funding required under maintenance of effort and or blueprint will need to be incorporated in FY25, as well as any proposed FY25 compensation adjustments that are submitted by the executive. In terms of some of the details beginning on page three of the staff report, in terms of the revenues, the uh, biggest increases from in the FY20, the December estimate could, compared to what was approved in June uh, come in property tax and income tax. Property tax is showing a $98.1 million increase um, over what was approved previously, and income tax is showing a $144 million increase. The transfer and recordation tax is kind of the other side of that equation, and that's showing a $33.8 million decrease. In terms of the property tax, um, these are the increase is primarily impacted by two factors. First is an increase in the assessable base coming in higher than projected. And second is the state changes to the income tax offset credit or ITOC program eligibility that resulted in reduced eligibility for the ITOC in FY24, as well as a recapture of ITOC credits that were issued in FY23. The assessable base changes are assumed to continue in the out years, while the revenue associated with, uh, with the ITOC, fewer ITOC recipients is phased downward in the out years given uncertainty over whether households will regain that ITOC eligibility going forward. The income tax increase of $144.4 million uh, is based on actual distributions to date from the state, as well as historical data uh, based on the January and February distributions. Overall, the fiscal plan shows income tax revenues continuing to increase in the out years, but at a lower, lower rate than was previously assumed. And that's the potential impact of the recession going forward. For transfer and recordation tax, the reductions here um, generally are, are a reflection of the continued weak real estate market. Um, and it's just important to note that reductions in tax revenues in, in this area uh, will potentially impact resources available for the CIP. On the expenditure side, OMB estimates that the county government's expenditures, expenditures will end up approximately $85 million greater than the approved FY24 budget. Um, the biggest component noted in OMB's transmittal memo is a projected $52 million increase in expenditures related to a couple different factors. The participation rate in the Working Families Income Supplement Program being higher than projected, increases in utility and fuel costs, and then anticipated overtime expenditures in fire and rescue services and transit services exceeding the budgeted amounts. These estimates are based on the actual expenditures through quarter one, and OMB has continue, will continue their past practice of submitting mid-year supplementals to address these uh, potential overages if they are projected to continue going forward. OMB also estimates that the county government could add 33.5 million in new expenditures in FY24. 
This estimate includes all the general fund supplemental and special appropriations that have either been introduced or acted on um, since the beginning of the fiscal year, and also includes a $15 million expenditure placeholder for snow removal and storm cleanup, which is traditionally included. In terms of the reserves, obviously we mentioned that FY24 is going to end uh, much higher than was originally projected, and the FY, sorry, FY23, and the FY24 reserves are currently estimated to end at 16.5%. In terms of the compensation sustainability, uh, the fiscal update estimates tax-supported revenue growth of 2.9% um, in FY25, and if it, we had a similar 2.9% uh, growth in compensation costs, that would equate to about $35.3 million um, in FY25, which is actually, actually similar to the annualized additional cost of the FY24 compensation increases. And the last thing we included in the staff report is a couple of regional updates. The first is uh, providing a little bit more information on the state um, and the, the cuts that they have recently proposed to the Consolidated Trans Transportation Program, and also some information on Prince George's County and their Spending Affordability Committee report, which projects uh, reduced revenues going forward and the potential consideration of cost containment measures. These are more presented as kind of for your information. What happens at the state and other counties doesn't ne necessarily mean similar things are going to happen um, in Montgomery County, but it's important to kind of understand what's going on in the region um, because those, those could have similar impacts uh, on Montgomery County going forward. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. President, for questions or um, if you'd like finance and OMB to make any comments. Well, thank you for that exhaustive review. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the collaboration between the executive branch and legislative branch and our teams. Uh, obviously, this is good news in the sense that uh, things are, are going relatively well, but it's uh, sobering in the sense that we understand that we maintain the fiscal caution uh, moving forward and that these are one-time funds, we have policies related to one-time funds, we have to be prudent. I've said before that fiscal responsibility is hardest when things seem to be going well, it's easiest when things are going really poorly because there's, uh, there, there, there uh, isn't the opportunity to make bad decisions because there aren't resources uh, to make them with. Uh, in this sense, uh, it, it is uh, much more challenging and where the, uh, the prudence uh, is uh, much more necessary. So I uh, just want to note that. Uh, any additional comments from OMB or for finance? Mr. Uh, Covey? Good morning. Thank you. I'm Mike Covey, the Director of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Friedson. Um, I, I would just say it's important to note some of the things that Mr. Howard talked about already. One time you just mentioned it yourself. Uh, the other thing is you, you heard about grumblings at MACO, uh, specifically about transportation funding. Um, sometimes that spills over into other things. The Board of Revenue Estimates is going to meet Thursday afternoon. It's important uh, that we take a look at that. Uh, we'll take a very close look at it when the report comes out, and we'll be having conversations with the Bureau of Revenue Estimates and, and staff in the State Controller's Office after that. The next big thing that happens after that, as far as income taxes are concerned, and the, the issue uh, with a board report would be income taxes as well, because as you may recall, uh, we used to get a distribution in November that was uh, um, comprised uh, most of the reconciling uh, distribution came in December, but over the last few years, because of changes in federal and state law, uh, that distribution has been sort of parceled out over the, over the uh, months after November. And this year, we're, uh, we understand that January will be the end of the reconciling uh, distribution. So it's very important. November was very good on income taxes. Uh, January is expected to be good too at this point, uh, but we need to see what January brings and what the board report says on Thursday to get a much better understanding of where we really are during FY24. And again, one time, you're correct about that. This is an excellent packet. If you want to have questions about uh, what we submitted, uh, we are here for that. I don't know if Jenny had anything that she wanted to talk about. Ms. Bryant? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to say um, congratulations to both Council President Friedson and Council Vice President Stewart on your new roles in the Council, um, and thank Council Central Staff for all of the work that they've done in their collaborative spirit in doing this work. 
Um, it, what uh, Mr. Howard portrayed here is absolutely correct. We are in a good position right now with the um, with the uh, reserves at 16.8%, which is well above our policy goal target. But um, as my colleague, um, Director Covey, has mentioned, and as Mr. Howard has mentioned, we do need to exercise some caution because these are one-time revenues as we are counting them right now. And um, we want to be in a position to invest those over um, the overage of the uh, revenues of the revenue um, of the revenue component to um, opportunities where they would do the best good in one-time situations. We we would advise um, against using them for ongoing expenditures, but you know that is a decision to be made by both all of you and the county executive. Um, we are in a good position right now, but we are um, also cautious as to other things that are going around going on around us in the state. Um, in their revenue estimates and what um, cuts they are asking their agencies to take in some of the jurisdictions surrounding us as well. So we do want to move forward in um, a, a very cautious position. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, and just want to acknowledge as well the comptroller noted that she is intending to share additional information and data points with the counties. And so I know we're very much looking forward to that. I previously worked with uh, with Mr. Covey and with Mr. Madalina, working with the Comptroller's Office on some of these significant policy changes, which have had material economic and fiscal impacts on the county uh, and, and the timing. So uh, hopefully the more information that we can get, the earlier, the easier it's going to be for, for you all to do your job so that we can do our job. But just want to acknowledge that and certainly appreciate the commitment from the Comptroller. Uh, on that. So uh, with that, let me turn to colleagues. Uh, start with uh, Council Vice President Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for an excellent packet and all the work that went into it. Um, I'm not going to reiterate what was said except to say one-time funds. And we're just going to keep saying that um, over and over again. And in that spirit, I wanted to drill down a little bit um, in uh, the part on the expenditures um, and uh, what we have here before us is that we know 85.5 million greater um, than was a, a million dollars greater than what was approved in FY24, and we're projecting 33.5 million in addition to that uh, for this budget year. Um, in the spirit of talking about one-time funds um, and what we know going into the next budget, um, I think it would be helpful to understand of those. Um, supplementals that we've been moving forward in the appropriations, which of those are one-time, how much is that one-time funding, and how much of that are we assuming is ongoing funding? Um, and I know that might not be easy to break down today, so we can get that information, but um, in the spirit of looking at the appropriations we're making throughout um, the year, I think it's also helpful to kind of keep track of um, what we're now assuming is basically in our budget uh, once we appropriate it. So um, that would be something I'd love to get more information on. Um, otherwise, this packet is excellent, and uh, I look forward to continuing the work together this year. Terrific. Well, thank you for that, not only Vice President, but uh, Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Chair. Uh, appreciate that. We'll be talking a little bit about some of those uh, appropriations later in today's conversation with the new approach that we've taken, which I think is help for us to be more comprehensive and, and thoughtful about these decisions, but uh, we need to continue to do that. We need to you know, think at the macro level of what impact these are going to have long term uh, on the county's fiscal health. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, uh, staff, for the packet, and thank you to the administration for, for the presentation and, and sharing of information. Uh, I want to think ahead a little bit. Um, and get some insight into the administration's philosophy as we are heading into the FY25 budget season. Um, just yesterday, Councilmember Mink and I attended a forum um, for, that the county executive held, uh, one of many he and, and your team have, have been hosting throughout the county, getting input uh, before the budget is developed, which I think over the last number of years has been a, a wonderful way to get input uh, before uh, uh, it's finalized. But given that there is a reserve of 16.8%, um, 
what is the administration's philosophy with regard to those reserves above the 10 percent? What, what do you think are, are good uses of those one-time funds? I don't know that I have a specific position on the greatest uses of those one-time funds. Um, obviously, we have capital projects that could certainly use some boost, especially in light of the um, reduction in recordation taxes and recordation premium taxes that all fund capital projects, um, including MCPS. I know the county executive will be entering into discussions about um, the asks that have come from the departments for FY25. That will ensue soon. Um, so OMB will be in a position to present um, those findings and the analysis that we have done on those budgets um, to him to better inform the decisions that he will make for FY25. Um, we you know, are in an advisory capacity and have noted that the excess revenues would be great for one-time investments um, in hoping that um, some of the resulting decisions reflect um, some of the advice that OMB has put forward to the county executive. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bryan. Uh, the, the other question I have, given the uh, increase in tax revenue and the, the size of the reserves, as you are developing the budget, uh, are you anticipating uh, any need to increase property tax rates? I, um, that's, uh, that's hard to say right now. I, I don't readily see um, the need to increase property taxes, but of course that decision is up to the elected official um, and Mr. Elridge will make his decisions and transmit that on March 15th to the County Council. So. We'll see where he stands. Uh, uh, thank you for that. That is right. We'll all be waiting until March 15th. Uh, but just want to remind you all that last year uh, a 10 percent property tax rate increase was proposed. This council uh, worked extremely hard over the two months we have the budget to reduce that to 4.7 percent while funding 98 percent of the executive's budget. And as you start uh, putting pen to paper, um, uh, I would uh, strongly encourage the administration uh, to replicate the hard work that we undertook to make sure that we provide uh, all the government services that our residents expect at the, at the service levels and quality that they expect, uh, but that we do so being mindful of the tax rates and of the surplus. Councilmember Glass, I would also like to add that, you know, a lot of the decisions that the county executive will have to make is dependent upon factors that we are not yet um, aware of. And one big factor is what will be the ask from Montgomery County Public Schools. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. That was um, a lot of the impetus for the reason why the county executive felt as though a tax increase was needed last year. And 100% of that tax increase is going to MCPS. So we are, we will be anxiously awaiting to see what um, the, the Board of Education sends to the county executive as an ask. And I'm sure he will make um, prudent decisions based on, on the factors that we have at that time. Very good. We'll find out on March 15th. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Councilmember Gerondo. Thank you. It's a perfect segue. Um, good morning, and thank you for all the work. Uh, as you mentioned, on Thursday, the superintendent will present her operating budget. So this is a big week, you know, budget-wise. Budget we're going to we're going to have that. And because of the policies we put forward in the Education and Culture Committee, we got a preview even before. And you know, I've been on this committee five years. We've never got as soon as a preview as we had in committee as we did this year that we know we're at a minimum getting 150 million dollars over last year right and we knew that was coming when we passed last year's budget because all many of these things are ESSER funded like social workers and mental health therapists that are going to be needed that are needed and are going to be moved over to the base budget so we created a problem for ourselves I argued uh, at the time uh, and didn't support the tax rate because it wasn't enough and so we are in a situation this year where uh, we are absolutely going to have to have more revenue just to meet the biggest part of our budget, MCPS, just to maintain what they're doing, not to do any accelerators or anything different. 
Um, so just want to be honest with everybody and, and that that is the situation that is where we are and, it's, and, and we played a role in it. Um, that being said, this is good news uh, that uh, we have a, sur you know, a surplus. We're at plus that 16 percent. I remember when we got on the council, we were, we were hovering below 10 percent. We were trying to achieve that number. Now we are well above it, so that's a good thing. Uh, we still have our AAA bond rating. Uh, and just today, inflation held steady again, uh, which means the Fed, which will meet later this week, will likely not raise interest rates. So a lot of good indicators. As Mr. Howard mentioned, though, you know, we can't get too high, can't get too low. Uh, but I've learned to celebrate when you have something to celebrate. And, and I think this week is, is looking good in that regard. Um, a, a couple things I wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Covey, I wanted to thank you and your team. You've been very responsive to our team when we've had folks call in about some of these tax changes, whether it be assessments. Uh, you know, a lot of constituents have had questions about that, uh, and you all have been very responsive. Uh, for people that are, you mentioned this a little bit, but for folks who are hearing about this, the budget shortfall at the state level, right, the $3.3 billion and the impacts on the transportation budget, could you provide a little more context to than you did earlier about what that means for us, and obviously you're looking towards the report later this week, but just what that could mean depending on what we find out. Well, yes, uh, th thank you for that too, I appreciate it. Uh, I am more interested uh, for from the revenue side on impact, on the income taxes. So I, oftentimes when there's a slowdown that they're showing in one a a revenue at the state, there's consequent showdowns in other revenues as well. Uh, the economy is slowing down a bit, employment is slowing down a bit, uh, income gains are slowing down a bit, so, um, you know, inflation also down a bit, which is a good thing. Uh, but um, but we're, sort of, we're sort of in a period right now that might be precedent to hopefully a very mild recession, if any recession at all. Hopefully there will be no recession. Um, so I, I was just thinking of the comments that the governor made on transportation revenues as sort of maybe a leading indicator for revenues generally, that's all. And, you know, we, um, unfortunately, the last, uh, the last Tuesday that the council meets in December is always before the Board of Revenue right. Estimates yeah. meets at the state. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're never we're never sure what right. they're going to say right. a couple days later. And because they have all of the information about income taxes and we have only the information that they provide to us, we are dependent on them to get anything of value uh, regarding uh, information about sure. income, income taxes. So, uh, so I, you know, I don't know if the transportation uh, revenues at the state uh, sort of presume something else is going to happen with state revenues generally, general fund revenues uh, in particular, or not. Um, but if it does, I think we'll see an inkling of that on Thursday afternoon when the board does meet. Um, I appreciate uh, so that. it was really just sort of, you know, let, let's, 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 let's assume that it might not just be transportation that, right. uh, that right. is the issue. Got it. Makes sense. But in the meantime, 98 million extra in property, 144 million in income. That's a good thing. You expect to have a good, some good news in the January report. Last uh, thing I'll just mention: if there's any guidance for residents who are concerned about assessments, a reminder to they reach out to the Maryland Department of Taxation and Assessments. Correct? Yes, that's right. And assessment notices are going to come out at the end of December, and people usually will get them in their mailbox, like the last day or two of December or maybe the first day or just two. Just in time for Christmas. Yeah. Or, 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 right the new year. Right or the new year. Or the new year. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, people should look at them. Um, and they have, uh, if I recall correctly, 45 days to do the easy appeal if, yep. they, uh, if they feel that they are uh, incorrect. Thank you. Just so, wanted to get that out there. Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you all for all of your attention to detail and uh, for your for your commentary here today. I, um, you know, as my colleague just mentioned, it, the, he used the phrase celebration. I'm going to use a slightly different one: gratitude. I am grateful um, that we have these projected one-time additional 
surplus funds. Um, but I'm also extremely cognizant of the healthy dose of realism that was delivered to us last week by the governor, not just with respect to the consolidated transportation plan, but in his overall remarks for those of us who were at the MAKO conference on Thursday night, I got the message loud and clear that this is time for pragmatism and, and caution and um, really being incredibly thoughtful about we, what we are doing moving forward in terms of our overall fiscal landscape. Um, and, and it was a very sobering conversation. Um, and I know that we have had a tone of let's not spend one-time funds for ongoing expenses, um, which is incredibly important. And I also, you know, I think I said several times during last budget season that we need to not have things marked as a one-time expense in the operating budget that have been there for years because those are not one-time expenses if they keep showing up year after year. Some of them during committee sessions were, were explained to have been in the budget for four years. So um, I, I hope we don't find ourselves in that situation during this year's operating budget. Um, and I don't know that the real estate market's going to yield any great changes for us on recordation tax either. Um, you know, we have a confluence of things happening. We have low inventory, we have high mortgage rates, and we do have our recordation tax that we increased last year. Those are three factors that go into the overall affordability of being able to buy a house in Montgomery County. So we have less real estate transactions happening. Um, and that will continue to, to hurt us in terms of of what we projected to be able to use in the CIP that we will not have. Um, and so for me, I'm looking at this as, you know, this would be a good time to prioritize what we have in a surplus to use for the CIP because those really are truly one-time expenses. That is the area of need where we're feeling strain from the lower than um, estimated recordation tax pressure. And also in terms of our residents and their, you know, their thoughts, I think there's definitely everybody appreciated during COVID things got a little strange, right? Um, but we know that delaying construction projects costs us more in the long run. So if we have the ability to take one-time funds um, to use towards the CIP, that seems like a very fiscally prudent and responsible thing to do so that we can keep the things in our CIP on track. And I'd love to hear feedback from, from all of you about what I just unpacked. Well, I, I would have to uh, agree with you. Uh, One-time nature of our budgeting process is um, certainly the capital budget where we build an asset and we put those assets on our books. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, we are in a, an OMB is in an advisory um, role with the county executive and we are having some conversations on what the upcoming um, a CIP will look like on January 15th, especially since some of these revenue factors will impact um, what we are able to do and carry forward and, and, um, and do in the future as far as capital projects is concerned. So um, we will uh, see where he lands and, uh, and hopefully um, we will all be in a good place once the recommendations come out in January. Thank you. Um, Mr. Howard, do you have any comments? Uh, just to say that that is, would certainly be a wonderful use of, of one-time revenues, because uh, as you mentioned, it is um, as one-time expenditures, and, and would certainly um, the council and the executive can determine how best to prioritize those dollars to meet the needs in, in the capital budget. I um, also want to note that the any surplus kind of above and beyond the 10% reserve also serves as a buffer um, for a, a recession that might end up being worse than anticipated. Right. Um, right. So it's important to remember that uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you. Appreciate that line of question. I'll just uh, remind colleagues last year when we were in a similar situation where we did have a significant influx of income tax, uh, I had advocated for the GEO committee formally recommended this body formally suggested very strongly to the executive uh, that one-time revenues be used for the capital budget. And so that has been consistent. I have been talking about that for years. Uh, I'll note that when times were tough, in the depths of the recession, we, we diverted $15.5 million. The executive recommended that we divert the PAYGO dollars, the cash that we use in the capital budget, 
to pay for expenses in the operating budget because of fiscal challenges. So if we are in tough times going to essentially divert money out of the capital budget when times are good in terms of one-time revenue, we should be doing the opposite. And not only is that helpful to supporting our huge priorities in the capital budget, which are always challenging to fund, uh, but it also sends very positive fiscal indicators for us meeting our fiscal policies, for us making the case to the rating agencies where we bring down the overall uh, debt load and debt ratios uh, that are some of the major indicators that uh, demonstrate the county's fiscal health. So I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge the context here. This is something that the council has been very steadfast in advocating for, and I'm glad that we're reiterating it uh, here today. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, great presentation, and this one's always awkward because it's always presented just a couple of weeks before we really know the complete picture. But So it's not really good or bad news at this point. Frankly, it's just news, uh, and we won't know whether it's good or bad until we get that assessed assessment from the state. Um, and obviously compounding the issue, as has been noted, um, is the governor's ominous communication to the public, sort of setting expectations for the upcoming state budget. And we will obviously have to dig in and see what the transportation impacts are going to be, which will be significant. Um, I guess just a, a couple of points. Um, we continue to hear from our commercial property owner that there's a looming cliff because they are going to be looking to aggressively reassess the values of their properties to try to write down the losses that they've been experiencing over the last several years. And our commercial properties have not recovered. This is a national issue, um, but particularly true in our region. And so that could be something on the horizon that we have to take into account. We won't know the exact impact of that, but it could obviously be significant. And so I appreciate the approach of being very cautious uh, and diligent in how we're looking at as you all prepare our next operating budget and when before that you present that to us because we have to continue to take a cautious lens, which I think is appropriate. Um, appreciate the comments of Chair Jawando with regards to MCPS. We do know, we knew then, we knew now that uh, we've got some real challenges ahead in how we work through the school system's budget, um, particularly because of the looming challenges that they're facing on every front we can possibly imagine right now. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that we gave them the, the single largest increase in the history of our county last year. Uh, and so that has an expiration date as well. We can't continue that year over year because it impacts the rest of the budget. So I will continue to look at this upcoming budget through that cautious lens, um, but I do appreciate you all. I just have one question. Um, I know that we're going to be meeting in short order with the state and get those assessments, but is there a ballpark? Is there a sense that we are getting one way or the other because the press release that was issued did not give a great deal of specificity on what exactly is going to be the impact from a transportation perspective. It was more macro level. Um, but do you have a sense of scale at this point? I'm sorry, Mr. Albanoz. As far as how the assessments are going to increase? Yes. Our, our presumption is that they're going to increase uh, to the extent that it shows in the uh, in the fiscal plan, so we we regarding regarding the what the uh, what the developers have said about uh, about especially office buildings. You know, I, they've reached out to I think council and and the executive, and I think we're all going to be talking about this. Uh, we started writing down property taxes because of in what we what we assumed would be. Uh, additional commercial appeals in 2020. Uh, remember, at the onset of the um, of the uh, pandemic, we the first thing that we noticed is that everybody <laughs> closed down, right? So we we've been looking at that, and we have written down revenues over the last several years uh, to accommodate uh, additional commercial appeals or or excess commercial appeals, whatever you want to whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, you know, recently the memo that came from uh, some of the developers had numbers associated with it and some analysis associated with it. So we'll be looking at that as well. 
to see how uh, to see if it comports with our understanding of where assessments are and where they're likely to go, along with information that we get from assessments and taxation, because we do get uh, monthly uh, data on commercial appeals. Uh, and the, the cliff uh, that Mr. Friedson mentioned, it hasn't happened quite yet. Uh, hopefully it won't happen at all. Uh, but um, I, honestly, our expectation was that it would have happened uh, before calendar year 2023. Um, so, so we are we are constantly reviewing commercial appeals and, and data from assessments and taxation, which we get at least once a month, uh, to see what is going on with uh, with our with our commercial uh, real property taxpayers. So, it's as you said, it's very important that we uh, that we understand what's going on. But we haven't seen anything drastic to date. Not not quite yet. So, but we are, you know, we are, we are paying attention. We are more than paying attention. We are actively uh, looking for information and data uh, that can sort of point to where we're going to be in the future. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just my, my final comment is we do need to continue to thank President Biden and the administration for their tremendous leadership over the last four years. Um, we have been able to weather the storm as a country, in large part because of that leadership. And so uh, let's hope that that leadership continues. Um, but we appreciate all the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Thank you all uh, for the information, the packet. Uh, it's it's always a bit of a um, are we celebrating the uh, the good news and concerned about the the next step? Um, but today we'll celebrate the good news. I just wanted to follow up just briefly on the commercial property. We recently had a, a briefing on commercial property, and um, I'm not surprised that um, that we haven't seen a lot of uh, requests for write downs. One of the issues that we that we are looking at is the the leases. Uh, so they had long-term leases, and those leases are coming up. And so when they're looking at, uh, uh, there's a difference in how how much space is being leased versus how much being how much space is actually being occupied. So when these long-term leases come up, uh, we're going to have a lot of vacancies, and they're going to come to us uh, for that. So I think I think there's another shoe to drop on the commercial property. Um, but I, I do want to um, thank Councilmember Jawando for reminding us about the assessment notices. Uh, we know exactly when they hit the mailboxes, uh, because even though um, th our offices don't handle that, uh, they do contact us uh, about their tax, about their uh, bills. And one of the things uh, just uh, that I wanted to mention was the um, I'm not surprised by the property tax impact of the change in the ITOC uh, um, request. I think that we had a lot of residents contact us surprised about why they didn't get this credit. And so I think that, and I think we have a responsibility to make sure our, all of our residents get the credit that they, that they deserve. And so uh, 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 in the coming years, I think we need to just continue to push that message out. Um, doesn't help us on the, on the tax side, but it certainly helps our individual residents on that. Um, and then also, uh, just following up, uh, uh, Vice President Stewart mentioned the um, tracking of the supplements and, and having an understanding of when that's a uh, one-time uh, expenditure. Um, we've been working throughout the year to, to for the council to have a much more uh, uh, global understanding of the cumulative effect of all the supplementals that we get, and I think that adding the um, one time is is important. Um, so we've all talked about the uh, one time expenditures for one time revenue, and I think we all agree with that. However, I think the property tax increase, um, the increase in um, assessed values is, is a more structural increase. And so are you considering that to be part of one-time revenue, or is that a structural increase in revenue? Uh, in terms of the fiscal plan, there is there is a structural increase in property tax revenue from the assessable base increases. So that is incorporated into the fiscal plan. The, um, the increase from the ITOC 
uh, from the people who did not file and, and from the recapture is considered more of a one-time revenue that gets phased out. Um, so that is that assumption is kind of incorporated into the fiscal plan. Um, the income tax is where the increases are projected to be less than they previously were projected, sure. um, and that's due to the, the recessionary impact. So those kind of um, the impact on the income tax can cancel out the potential increase of the property tax, and, and, and we'll see how that plays out going forward. Okay, thank you. That's that's what I assume. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. It's the first time I've called you, Mr. President, in public, and. And uh, I'm sorry I could not be here for the vote for you and Vice President Stewart. Me either, so yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> but I, I was going to filibuster. No, I um, did want to very publicly say I'm very, very pleased that both of you are in, in the positions you are in. And if I were here, I would have certainly voted for both of you. Um, I appreciate all the information that you've presented today. It shows a lot of hard work, and it's, 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 uh, it's necessary that we get reminded uh, consistently about what we're what we're trying to do here can someone remind me if a if a property owner um, uh, uh, appeals their assessment because they have a vacancy in the building I mean the assessments are based on all these formulas but one of it's the the uh, tenant that they have and then they and they get a lower rate and then they get a tenant what happens at that point there is no change after it's retenanted until the next assessment cycle. Just three years. Yes. Well, it could be three years. Yeah. Or, yeah, it depends. Because remember, a property owner can appeal at any point uh, in the process, uh, in the three-year cycle. You know, I and I appreciate that. I believe we need to make certain and work hard to get every spot leased, et cetera, et cetera. But if and when it happens, I don't know that we should not get something beyond what we've been getting. And I guess that would be a change for state law. It would be a change in state so law. So I think yeah. that's something we should work on. Um, and I appreciate the, um, the I, it, it, as Councilmember Balco mentioned, about the, the difference between being uh, leased and occupied. The other question is, how many of those who are leasing and occupying are actually paying their rent? Because that becomes another issue for the the, the, the uh, property owner that we want to be uh, aware of as well. Yeah, budgets are such an interesting discussion. I, years ago, I had a fellow tell me that a budget is like nailing a custard pie to the wall. You just never know when you're done. He was, he was a country guy. But, but um, I, I, there, are, there is some truth to that. All of this is predictions. All of this is we think, and then of course we want to be we want to be conservative, but yet we don't. But we want to be accurate. So it's it's a difficult thing, but I think the overall part of this is that uh, that we need to make certain that we have all the facts before we decide on whether tax rate or anything else should be. Um, somebody believes you if you're. Uh, consider raising taxes as the very last thing you would ever consider. You try everything else first. But I do believe we need to wait for as much information as we can possibly get so that we can be as accurate as we possibly can be for, for our budget process. This, this budget process, every one of them, uh, from my uh, time uh, being involved, has always been difficult. I think this one is going to have the distinction of being the most difficult. So thank you very much for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. President. The most difficult budget since last year <laughs> and until next year. Definitely. I, 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 I agree. Pre appreciate, uh, appreciate that. If, uh, if there was any group of people who were going to be nailing custard pie to a wall, I'm just grateful that it's you. Uh, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Good morning, and I would like to echo the comments from my colleagues. It has been a great report, and thank you so much for your work. Um, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Just based on the experience from last year on the budget, it was really, I know, although we did the right thing about increasing the budget by 4.7%, it was really hard, mostly on our families. Although we did it, you know, to ensure that we had enough funds for MCPS, it's really hard on low-income families to get, you know, hit by this tax. So I say that um, to please, and I'll do that myself too, um, 
I think we need to be really proactive in telling MCPS that having another property tax increase is not an option. I just don't see how can that be possible. Um, I had one-on-one -on -one in group meetings with different civic associations in my district, which has high proportions of low-income families, and it was really hard to make them understand why we're doing this and uh, hearing their stories that they are struggling to make ends meet at home. So we're trying to solve one problem on one hand and harming people on the other hand. So I think we really need to make sure that message is, uh, is, is pointed out with um, NCPS. As he was uh, mentioned, they have a, the school system has a, a meeting on Thursday with their proposed budget. I'm gonna be there. And I'm gonna tell them exactly what I'm telling you right now. Um, so whatever they're going to be proposing needs to be um, mindful of the economic realities. This looks great, but it's it's not it's not a it's not a door that you can just open and say, oh, we can ask for more money now because things look great. It doesn't work that way. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the record. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, everyone, for the very thorough packet. Um, I was uh, very glad to see this, uh, um, the revenue that um, exceeded uh, projections, uh, unlike the uh, budget we inherited last year. So looking forward to seeing what the uh, county executive will be recommending in his upcoming um, budget. Um, can staff share more on um, the biggest reason for a um, total tax revenue exceeding what was originally budgeted and if this will be a recurring pattern? I may have missed that response. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then finance and OMB can correct anything that I, that, that I miss. Um, but the biggest reasons is uh, the increases in both the property tax coming in above projections okay. and then the income tax coming in above projections. The property tax has a couple different factors that we've, as we talked about, the one being the accessible base, the other the, the ITOC uh, recapture and, and, and less ITOC payments that were paid out. Um, and the income tax, uh, Mr. Covey, you mentioned, it's, it's some of that is still um, kind of the, the following along the trajectory of um, the 2021 tax year returns and where those are coming in. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of going forward, the projections have um, are pretty much the same Stable. as what was projected um, in the approved budget. So you know, with, with a little bit of variation each year. So the idea being that the, the influx of revenues in 23 and 24 are currently not expected to continue at the same rate um, that they did um, these past two years. Thank you. Okay. Sure, I'll just add to that. That was very good, uh, Mr. Howard, thank you. Um, part of it uh, for income taxes is that we've shifted the recession. We, we've shifted. Yeah. Our, thank our, you. Our <laughs> assumptions are that the recession will happen in 2024, in calendar 2024, mm -hmm. rather than in 2023. And so, Part of, the, part of the reason for additional income tax revenues is that shift. Okay. And that, as Mr. Howard just noted, that means that uh, out-year revenues for income taxes are a little bit lower, actually, than, than, uh, than we had predicted uh, for the, uh, for the uh, budget. Um, the other thing is that uh, personal income growth did not, uh, did, did not decrease as much as we had expected. Okay. Uh, which is a good thing, yeah. uh, and 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 that would, of course, uh, uh, happen uh, the decrease in the midst of a recession. So, and hopefully, we're not heading into a recession imminently or ever again. Ever be again. Nice ever again. That's what we happens. hope will be forecasted again. Um, and just one more question: um, uh, We all heard that the transportation funding was cut, and we've seen how it's impacting plans regionally. Um, just wanted to know if we have any ideas about how we can best absorb um, transportation funding cuts, how we're anticipating um, handling that. 
think there's a lot of detail that still needs to be learned about the specific cuts and where they will impact and, yeah. and what impacts will what cuts specifically will impact the county both from a, um, a capital side yes. um, as well as what potentially might happen on an operating side so I think a lot of that is still kind of TBD okay. um, depending on as the state comes about with more details in their proposed cuts and, and how that specifically impacts um, the county and then all of that will have to be packaged into um, the March 15th transmittal from the executive and, and we'll certainly um, work to to make sure we understand all those factors all right thank you so much uh, thank you obviously very concerned I talked about this yesterday 17.4 million in potential cuts to ride on service that serve some of our most vulnerable residents 1.7 million in potential cuts to highway user revenues which are very important to uh, maintaining our roadways for uh, our residents. So uh, a lot of things to parse out and to work through. We want to work collaboratively with the governor and the administration, but certainly very concerning for the county's ability to continue on with the progress that we made, particularly in bus transit services, but also in just our broader priorities. I appreciate the, the, the questions. Uh, Councilmember Ming. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you to staff for a very thorough packet. Much appreciated. I um, wanted to second the comments of our Vice President around how helpful it would be to get that breakdown as we look at the appropriations about um, what are what we're anticipating being ongoing expenses and what are not, just as uh, kind of a, a matter of, of regular tracking moving forward. That is a great call. Um, really looking forward to digging into the potential impact on CIP, especially given that we have several really important projects of course, uh, in East County, including the Montgomery College East County campus uh, that we're all hoping to see movement on in the very near future. Um, and we're obviously waiting on more information to get into more detailed conversations, um, but wanted to just note that a lot of times as we discuss the budget, and I completely include myself in this, it can often turn into like what we, the council, will or won't give to uh, this or that department or agency. Um, and, you know, just wanted to frame that ultimately, you know, of course, this isn't about us, the council, giving gifts. It's, it's our job to ensure to the best of our ability that our residents are each getting their needs met through the various departments and agencies that we fund. And so ultimately those are the calculations that we need to make as we decide um, what we're going to uh, uh, keep in reserves and what we're not, how we're going to divvy up what's left, um, and balancing that with the fiscal responsibility that we obviously uh, need to maintain moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other colleagues wishing to speak. I just want to, again, express our appreciation for the collaboration between the executive team and our council team. This was a terrific presentation and packet. I know a lot of hard work has gone into it, and now uh, the, the rest of the work begins starting Thursday with what we hear from our state partners and moving forward as we head into the budget. Lots more conversations to be had, but this was a very important start. So thank you, everybody. and. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Happy holidays uh, to you all and best of luck as you continue moving forward with putting together the, the budget and parsing through what we hear from our partners at the state. With that, colleagues, we are going to now sit as the district council. The first item for the district council is the introduction for zoning text amendment 2311 regulatory approvals, conditional use. Uh, I am the lead sponsor and this ZTA would eliminate unnecessary regulatory burdens that add additional cost and time in conditional use application and regulatory review processes. If we want to remain economically competitive and grow our economy and reach our full potential as a county, we must eliminate unnecessary regulatory red tape and make doing business in Montgomery County easier, faster, and less expensive. The introduction of this ZTA offers another step forward in this regard, making several common sense improvements to the conditional use application and review process. For nearly a year, uh, actually over a year at this point, I've been working with our hearing examiners, planning department staff, and Ms. Nadu on ways to streamline the conditional use process. The proposed changes in the attached legislation reflect recommendations from all of our stakeholders and partners based on historical findings and practices, providing common sense procedural changes, and allowing certain small businesses, including home-based 
family daycare to move forward in a, in a much less cumbersome way. New limited use standards are proposed for uh, each of the changes. Uh, and and uh, in a moment, we're going to also introduce companion piece of legislation uh, to the zoning text amendment uh, that is the SRA, uh, which allows concurrent review of a preliminary plan uh, and conditional use application, expediting the application review process. Combine these measures eliminate unnecessary hurdles while making it easier to operate a home-based child care to run a rural country market or operate as a home health practitioner. I hope you'll join me in improving the conditional use process, a process that has conditionally drawn criticism for being overly burdensome at times, and become a co-sponsor uh, and supporter uh, as we move forward. Uh, with that, let me turn it to Ms. Nadu if you have anything to add about this introduction and just want to express my appreciation again to you, to the hearing examiner, to the planning department uh, for all the collaboration putting this forward. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, with that, uh, this zoning text amendment is now introduced. The next item on the agenda is the uh, introduction of the subdivision regulation amendment, SRA 2302, preliminary plan approval procedures. I am the lead sponsor of this as well, and as noted previously, uh, this is the companion uh, legislation, the uh, 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 SRA. Uh, in order to allow for uh, these processes to move forward through subdivision. Ms. Nadu, anything to add? Uh, with that, no, nothing from colleagues. This uh, SRA 20, uh, 2302 is now introduced. Okay. The District Council will now take action on Zoning Text Amendment 2306, Fenton Village Overlay Zone Site Plan. This uh, SRA came to the PHP committee uh, on December 11th. It was introduced by council members Glass and Stewart, uh, and it will remove the site plan requirement for certain projects in the Fenton Village overlay zone. Uh, Ms. Nadu, do you want to give a synopsis? Absolutely. Uh, so as council president uh, Friedson noted, the, this will move the site plan requirement for certain projects. Um, it's going to be scaled down for compatibility. So this overlay zone was established in the year 2000. And what the ZTA will do is it will allow developers who are doing minor projects to skip that site plan review process. Um, what will qualify is any addition, reconstruction, or exterior alteration that's one story up to a maximum of 15 feet. And that doesn't change the gross floor area by less than a thousand square feet. The PHP committee reviewed this yesterday. Uh, planning board supported the ZTA and there were no amendments. Appreciate it. Uh, unanimous decision and committee recommendation from the Planning, Housing and Parks Committee. Uh, this is uh, a way to make it a little bit easier for our very important businesses uh, in this very important area in, front, uh, in Fenton Village uh, in the Silver Spring area. Let me turn it over to one of the lead sponsors, Councilmember Glatt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, appreciate uh, you and members of the PHP committee uh, for taking this up yesterday and appreciate working with the district council member, uh, Vice President Stewart, to, to move this forward. Uh, bottom line is when the Fenton Village overlay zone was adopted, we have uh, great big visions for that community uh, and often overlooked in great big visions are small minor details sometimes, uh, not details but projects. Um, the details are always uh, reviewed, but here there are some uh, small projects uh, that just need to be accommodated uh, to help the small businesses of that area, and that's what this ZTA aims to uh, support. So hope, uh, looking forward to the support of all of our colleagues. Great, thank you. Let me turn it to the other lead sponsor, District Council Member Vice President Stewart. Thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Glass and his office and Ms. Nadu for uh, putting this all together. Um, as has been stated, this is just sort of a, a minor adjustment, um, a tweak, but it means so much to um, the residents and the small businesses of this area. Um, I think it is a good reminder for us when we have processes in place um, that take people, especially individual residents and small businesses, um, additional time, month, and hurdles to jump through um, to make small changes to their business or place of residence, um, it has a huge impact on them. 
And so I'm really glad that we're able to make this change. Um, I thank the uh, Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee for um, allowing me to join in yesterday and for their unanimous recommendation to move this forward. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll also note that this doesn't change the uh, uh, the zoning and the underlying zone. It just makes it a little bit easier to move forward in the process to support local businesses in the county. Uh, with that, we have a committee recommendation. And so we don't need a motion uh, since we have a, uh, uh, a, a uh, committee recommendation. So do we, is this a roll call vote? This is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Lukey. Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink. Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales. Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Glass. Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando. Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz. Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz. Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez. Yes. Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Okay, and that is unanimous. Congratulations. Okay, the next item for the District Council's consideration is action on a resolution to adopt the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. The Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan provides critical uh, uh, investment and opportunity to fulfill our commitments to the residents of East County by encouraging investment in the area, ensuring residents have the housing, jobs, infrastructure, and amenities they need and deserve. This is an area that's already rich in so many amenities, including park amenities and public facilities and proximate to a neighboring jurisdiction in Prince George's County. And this now is going to help us to be better positioned to fulfill the potential uh, of a community that, that, that certainly deserves it. Uh, and I'll note uh, this is the first master plan uh, undertaken uh, under our new general plan under Thrive uh, and really appreciate the work of the Planning, Housing and Parks Committee and particularly uh, as well, council staff and planning staff uh, for your collaboration working through uh, these items and coming up with what has been a, a consensus uh, and, and uh, appreciate the engagement of the district council member who participated in, uh, in virtually and in person uh, in all of the uh, sessions uh, that we had before turning it over to staff for any final uh, comments here since we have taken straw votes already. Uh, let me turn it over to the district council member uh, for any comments if she would like. Sure. So thanks so much uh, to the council president, to the PHP committee, uh, and to uh, all of the staff who worked on this from both the, on both the council side uh, and on planning. Um, I spoke to my excitement about this plan after we took the straw vote, so I won't be too long here. Just say once again um, my gratitude uh, to all of you and to the community members who gave their input to help shape this plan as well. Um, it is time for East County to, to get its due, and with this plan we're really setting the table uh, for new amenities, new retail and commercial job centers, new housing, uh, and more walkable and transit-connected communities uh, in an area of the county that has been demanding it for many, many years. So excited to be part of the council uh, that is helping to move those things forward at, at a faster clip. Thanks again, uh, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, any comments from uh, council staff or planning staff? Um, I just want to express my gratitude to uh, Mr. Kenny on his first master plan here as Council Central staff with me. Um, it's been a pleasure working with him. Um, and to thank the planning department for um, just great collaborative work working through this plan and um, to congratulate them. It's a great achievement and it's exciting that it's getting passed today. Sounds good. Uh, would you like to make a motion uh, to approve the Fairland Briggs Cheney master plan? I'd like to make a motion to approve the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan. We have a motion from the district council member. We have a second from colleague on the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, Council Member Juwando. All in favor of the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Congratulations. This council has passed a master plan, which is great. Before we move on to our next item, I did want to take a brief moment here to express my personal gratitude and the gratitude of this body and this county council to Tanya Stern for her service to our community, for her leadership of the planning department, 
uh, particularly at a time of significant transition and challenge. Ms. Stern stepped up, provided a steady hand, professionalism, and a level of grace and humility to lead us uh, and to lead the team at the planning department. We're very grateful to have a terrific team of professionals, award-winning professionals in the planning department, but they need a leader. And they had a leader at a time when they desperately need it. We are sad to see you go, certainly a loss for Montgomery County, uh, but a tremendous gain for Prince William County and for our, our colleagues. We never like to lose anybody anywhere. We particularly don't like to lose anybody to our, 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 our neighbors uh, across the river, but we know it's a, a great opportunity uh, for you personally and professionally. We wish you nothing but the best and your imprint and your impact uh, on our county over the course of your career here, but uh, in particular over the past 14 or so months uh, at a time when, when we really needed it. Uh, we'll never be forgotten and we, we hold you in, in, in great esteem uh, and with a great deal of appreciation and gratitude. And so thank you so much and congratulations. Tanya Stern, Deputy Planning Director with Every Planning. <laughs> For the last time, <laughs> I last appreciate time. that, exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to say I'm uh, just incredibly honored uh, to have served Montgomery County during my five years, five, almost five and a half years, with Montgomery Planning and with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and also just incredibly honored to have served as Acting Planning Director during that, that uh, time of transition over uh, 13 months. Um, as just stated, Montgomery Planning has just a fantastic staff, some of the best planners in the country. And uh, I think that is something that we should continue to celebrate and will continue to occur under uh, Planning Director Jason Sartori and our Planning Board Chair Artie Harris. I'm definitely looking forward to continuing to collaborate with Montgomery County in my new role as Planning Director in Prince William County. I very much believe in regionalism. We're all dealing with a lot of the same issues, so there's a, a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, but, but also just wanted to say lastly, I'm just incredibly, incredibly appreciative of the support from the County Council, uh, particularly Council Member Gabe Albernaz, who was Council President during the time I became Acting Planning Director, and definitely uh, Council President Andrew Friedson, uh, with whom I've worked uh, very closely um, as part of the Planning uh, Housing and Parks Committee, as well as the members of that committee and other Council Members, Council Member Glass as well. Um, I can name all of you. You've all been very, very supportive and just wanted to say I'm just uh, deeply grateful and uh, looking forward to continuing the collaboration on a regional basis. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Juwanda. Thank you. I just want to say briefly, and you mentioned it, um, as ch I was chair of Region 4 this year, you were the representative for many years there. I hope you will still be there. So I get to work with you still. So I'm my, all my colleagues can be jealous in that, in that of that. But seriously, thank you. you. You've done a great job, as the council president said, and we're going to miss you. So wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Albernock. Thank you. I appreciate the shout out to all of us, Ms. Stern. And I do just want to acknowledge your tremendous leadership. I used to introduce County Executive by Le Leggett by saying he uh, ate um, calm for breakfast, cool for lunch, collected for dinner, and for dessert, always got an extra helping of humility and wisdom. And I would apply that same to thing to you. So thank you for your leadership. Here, here to that, absolutely. Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Man, after that, I, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, I am so happy, and I think we as a county were so blessed that you came over five years ago. I was on the planning board when, when you arrived, and I mean, you really shine, and i really grateful that you came over, and I am so proud of you becoming a director in, in Virginia. It's, it's a big deal. And I look forward to continuing working uh, with you. And I want to thank you for being part of the Wheaton Arts and Entertainment Advisory Board. I'm so sad you're leaving, but um, I know I can always call you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And just want to express again our, our gratitude for, for your service, particularly for stepping up at, at such a significant time and to offer you our well wishes and to please don't be a stranger for us. We look forward to that regionalism and look forward to continuing to be able to work together to build our community regionally in the best way that we possibly can. So thank you so much and happy holidays to everybody.
Okay, with that, we have an announcement for the record uh, pending the planning board's approval of the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. The County Council will hold a public hearing on the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan on January 25th, 2024 at 7 p.m. at Tacoma Park Middle School, 7611 Piney Branch Road, Tacoma Park, Maryland, 20912. If the facility is closed due to inclement weather, the public hearing will be held on February 1st at 7 p.m. at Tacoma Park Middle School. Those wishing to register to speak may do so on Friday, December 15th, 2023, via the County Council's website. And I just want to note this is part of our continued effort, a commitment that I made as the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee chair, and that the former Council President made as we entered into this new 20th uh, Council that we are going to uh, continue uh, to hold as many public hearings as we can in the community. You shouldn't have to come to the County Council to interface with your county council members and to weigh in on the future of your community. Uh, this is part of that effort. It will continue to be an intentional part of the way that we do uh, our work and we are hopeful and strongly encourage as much community engagement as possible. And we're gonna do everything that we can to continue to make it as easy and as accessible as possible. So uh, important to make that announcement and appreciate colleagues for their shared commitment uh, on, that, uh, on that interest. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our legislative session. Today is legislative day number 35. I know most people watching already knew that and have been uh, keeping tallies on their, on their calendars at home. Uh, there are two bills for introduction uh, today. Uh, first, we have Bill 4523, Property Tax Credit, Individual 65 and Above, Retired Military Service Members and Disabled Service Members. Uh, I am the lead sponsor, and the public hearing is scheduled for January 23rd at 1.30 p.m. As I noted in my remarks last Tuesday, I want to focus the year ahead on unleashing the potential of our older adult population and fulfilling our capabilities as a county of vital aging and a community for a lifetime. Older adults are the fastest growing segment of our population in Montgomery County. Every single year, more than 9,000 residents turn 65 and more than 31% of households include at least one resident 65 years and, and older. While Montgomery County has been designated an age-friendly community, rising costs of living have restricted the ability of older adults to age in place. Living with dignity and vitality in our community is becoming increasingly out of reach, and we must work together to reverse this trend. Bill 4523 would address residents' needs by expanding the eligibility criteria for property tax credit in several ways. First, the bill would expand eligibility to certain disabled veterans and their surviving spouses. Second, the bill would allow individuals to qualify for the credit if the assessed value of their home does not exceed $899,900, a value which would be tied to inflation moving forward. The bill would also increase the number of years an individual may qualify for the credit from seven to 10 years and reduce the amount of time a beneficiary would have to reside in a home in order to qualify for the credit from 40 years to 25 years. Lastly, and most importantly, this legislation will help us create a more equitable property tax credit program by instituting an income-based requirement. Instead of a broad 20% credit for all those who qualify, I'm proposing a tiered credit where applicants can receive up to 50% credit based on their income. More specifically, qualifying applicants earning 90,000 or less in annual income would receive a 20% credit. Applicants earning 75,000 or less in annual income would receive a 35% credit, and residents earning 50,000 or less in annual income would receive a 50% credit. Furthermore, to ensure that we're not leaving residents behind, the bill provides any existing beneficiaries of the current tax credit who would not qualify under this bill to be grandfathered. As, a cost of living, as our cost of living and property tax assessments continue to rise, our residents need a revitalized property tax credit program that reflects their lived experience and their needs. I look forward to closely examining this property tax credit along with you and our executive branch partners to determine how it can best serve our residents moving forward. I appreciate your thoughtful consideration. And with that, let me turn it over first to uh, Council Member Albernaz. Um, thank you, Mr. President. This obviously is a critical issue that all of us hear about uh, and understandably hear about from our constituents. I uh, appreciate the thoughtful approach with which you have tackled this very complex issue. Look forward to the ongoing discussion, um, but do uh, want to be listed as a co-sponsor at this point. Appreciate that. Thank you. Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Thank you so much to the Council President for his leadership on this issue. I would also love to be a co-sponsor of your bill. 
Thank you for your support. Council Member Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I know uh, Council Member Katz and I had a, had a bill last year to make some improvements, and that was a, a start, not the finish. And so I would appreciate being added as a co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Absolutely appreciate that. Thank you. Council Member Balcom. Um, yes, thank you for introducing this bill. I would like to be a co-sponsor. I think it goes uh, a long way to helping people stay in their homes. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for your support. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, for introducing this legislation. I'm so glad that um, we've added um, uh, um, benefits for our veterans and our disabled service members and would be proud to co-sponsor as well. Thank, thank you. you for your support. Councilmember Katz. Thank you, and I, uh, Council Member Lukey said it well when we uh, had this leg uh, similar legislation or uh, legislation early on, we certainly realized that we needed to have further discussions. I think we probably still need to have a few further discussions on this. There might be some amendments that we all need to consider, but I too would like to be listed as a co-sponsor. Thank you, appreciate that. And with that, I don't see any other colleagues. Appreciate uh, all those uh, supporting and wishing to co-sponsor and look forward to a really important conversation of how we can help our residents in a way that is targeted and thoughtful and supports their needs. So uh, with that, uh, that uh, legislation uh, is introduced unless uh, Ms. Wellens has anything to add that we have missed. Just a very uh, brief note, Mr. Council President, that there is a substantive typo. I just wanted to correct for the record in the staff packet on page two of the staff report. Um, the number, the dollar amount, um, 899999 should actually be $899,900. I'll get the, the record corrected online, but just wanted to note that so that there wasn't potentially confusion. Thank you. Appreciate that uh, correction, and we will make that. And with that, that uh, legislation is now introduced. Uh, with that, uh, we are now going to move on to the introduction of expedited bill 4623, uh, OPT, SLT, bargaining units, pension and retirement adjustments. The lead sponsor is Council Member Katz, and let me turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, this one is uh, the purpose of the bill is to extend the deadline from January 4th, 2024 to August 7th, 2024 for the current emergency communication center personnel, the dispatchers, to provide the opportunity to transition into their new pension from their current retirement accounts. This has become a very confusing um, discussion. It was negotiated. Everybody, I, I could say, uh, I believe all of us agree, we don't want to lose one dispatcher over this issue, but they need time to figure out what is in their best interest. And by doing this, by moving it from January 4th to August 7th, it's going to help do that. The actuarial calculations took longer than anticipated, and employees need the additional time to present to be presented with their options to make the decisions needed regarding their retirement. And so uh, this, is, this is something that we will, uh, during this time uh, and, and going to public hearing, we can make certain that everyone remem is reminded once again how important they are to our system. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Before turning it over to Ms. Uh, Wellens, let me turn it over to colleagues, Council Member Jawanda. Thank you. I uh, appreciate Council Member Katz introducing this. Um, as you mentioned, our emergency communications staff are critical. They're, they serve a super important purpose. They're overtaxed and are doing a lot, and we're trying to change their job at the same time and have them do more for us. So uh, anything that can help give them a little more uh, benefit and flexibility is a good thing. So appreciate you uh, working on this. would like to be added as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Let me turn it over to Council Member Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, yes, I too want to thank our public safety chair for taking this important step to make sure our emergency call center folks are able to take advantage of having time to sort this out um, and do what's right for them in their, in their own best interest. They are a critical part of our public safety ecosystem. And uh, I would too like to be added as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Abernas. I'd like to be listed as a co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn it over to Council, Member Stewart, uh, Council Vice President Stewart. It's my first time making that mistake. I will commit to not making it again, and I will follow through on that 
most times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Katz, um, for moving this forward. I'd like to be added as co-sponsor. Thank you for that. Uh, I see Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. I, too, would like to be added as a co-sponsor, and thank you to Councilmember Katz for introducing. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Very important adjustment, and I'd like to be added as co-sponsor. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Uh, yes, thank you. Please add me as a co-sponsor. Thank you. And I will be added as a co-sponsor as well. Me too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Councilmember Fani Gonzalez has been added as a co-sponsor. You weren't the only one, but uh, you are now added. <laughs> Okay. All right. Speak now. Forever hold your peace. I don't see any other colleagues. Let me turn it over to Ms. Wellens to uh, add anything that may have been missed. Nothing to add. Thank you. The comprehensive, that was easier than pinning a custard pie to the wall and you nailed it. Uh, so just, just I, I, you know, I, not, not, not unintentional there. I appreciate it. That bill is now introduced. Okay. Moving on. The council is now taking final action on Bill 3623, Sale of Firearms or Ammunition, Suicide Awareness and Firearms Education, also known as the SAFE Act. The uh, Health and Human Services Committee recommends enactment with amendments. Let me turn it over to Chair Albernaz for the committee report. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I am actually going to turn it over to the staff for this one to make sure I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and council members. Um, bill 3623, the HHS committee considered the bill and looked at it uh, thoroughly um, and recommended the enactment of the bill with one clarifying amendment. The clarifying amendment uh, would be to indicate that the sole means for enforcement of the requirements of the bill would be civil citations as opposed to criminal citations. Um, just bringing you to the staff packet, um, you'll note that the HHS committee looked at uh, evidence linking the um, linking firearms to suicides, um, including national data, indicating 56% of gun-related deaths in 2022. Uh, you can see on page two of the staff memorandum, drilling down a bit to the Montgomery County data showing at least 30% of suicides by firearm in Montgomery County since 2018. The uh, committee emphasized um, that the purpose and effect of the bill is to um, not to place any conditions upon sales of guns, but rather it's a public health and education um, bill and based upon the uh, prevalent and alarming use of firearms for suicide. Um, there is one potential, so again, the, the committee recommended an enactment with the clarifying amendment already mentioned. The one potential issue for council consideration that's identified in the packet is whether the council has any interest in further amending the bill to instead of saying that um, that the, a gun shop must distribute the um, suicide prevention literature at, upon a point of sale to say that actually they will need to the gun shop would need to uh, place the literature literature in a conspicuous place, make it available, and also um, hand, physically hand the uh, literature to each person entering the shop. Um, there are a few reasons that this amendment might be desirable, um, including, as you know, in the public packet, there are potential litigants uh, making various arguments against the bill. We believe that this amendment would strengthen the bill against those potential arguments. Um, and in addition, there was discussion that um, that the amendment might assist with enforcement because uh, an enforcement officer, instead of needing to observe a gun sale to have been completed and the literature, literature to have been distributed to monitor whether the um, requirements of the bill um, have taken place, instead of that, um, 
every person entering the gun shop would be required to be provided with the literature and thus that would be a simpler thing to observe and therefore enforce. In addition, um, providing the literature to each person entering the shop uh, would increase the number of people that are receiving this valuable health information. Um, so I believe that's it, that committee recommendation. And then the, there's that one potential additional amendment noted for the council's consideration um, here at the final vote. Thank you. Thank I'm you, Ms. Mullins. I'll just questions. note, Mr. President, that uh, it was a very robust discussion. I want to once again thank Councilmember Glass for his introduction and leadership on this. Um, we do believe that this will make a significant impact on an issue that's very complicated and sensitive. And uh, I believe I will yield to you, but I believe our colleague on the HHS committee has a specific amendment that she would like to propose. But I yield to you, Mr. President, to call on her. And that's Councilmember Lukey. Sounds good. I'm going to call on her in a second. I'm going to turn it to the to the bill sponsor first to give him an opportunity to speak, and then I'll turn it to Councilmember Lukey. Let me start with the, the sponsor of the legislation, Councilmember Ka uh, Glass. Uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I want to extend my appreciation uh, to the HHS committee for a um, a thoughtful conversation, uh, one that I know is going to continue here uh, from the dais because we have to figure out how we make all of our residents safe and that there are uh, decisions being made at various levels of government uh, that are making it harder and harder to make our residents safe. And so in crafting uh, legislation to support all of our residents, we have to be thoughtful throughout that process. Uh, and I want to extend my appreciation to Ms. Wellens for the work up until this point, uh, and that work will continue uh, once we hear from uh, Councilmember Ludke. So thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for those words, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Let me turn it to Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, and, and thank you, Councilmember Glass, for your leadership. Um, I personally truly appreciate everything that you did to, to bring this bill to fruition and was proud to sign on as a co-sponsor and as noted by council member and, and public, uh, HHS chair Albernaz, um, you know, we had a very robust discussion and I said multiple times during that committee discussion what an important public health issue this is and um, I, I had, had read something in the Journal of Injury Epidemiology. It was from October of 2021. It states emphatically, firearm suicide is a major public health issue in the USA. Firearms are readily available to Americans whether or not they have them in their own home. The United States has 1.21 civilian owned guns per capita, more than twice of that of next ranking Yemen. The U.S. number of guns per capita is six times the average rate of the other um, organization for economic cooperation and development nations. That is significant. Um, and it's, it's undisputed that we need to take a public health approach, a science-based approach to uh, prevention of gun violence and suicide, and we need to be collaborative. And I appreciate the, the goals of this um, legislation. I would like to move to amend subsection B of the, uh, this, of the SAFE Act to read as follows. A gun shop must make conspicuous and available and must provide to each person who enters the shop the literature prepared under subsection A. As I just noted, it's not just those who purchase a firearm, it's about people who may be in proximity to a firearm. And so um, this amendment clarifies that because it, it mandates the provision to each person who happens to come in the shop. That's one way to reach people from a common, self, common sense public health perspective to provide valuable information. With that, I yield. I'd like to second that motion. Okay, I was gonna ask if there was a second and we already have one, so I don't need to. It's uh, seconded uh, by Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, I don't see any colleagues wishing to speak to the motion, so we will vote on it. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. That has been approved unanimously. Any colleagues wishing to speak on the measure? Let me turn it back to uh, Council Member Lukey. Um, this is really for Ms. Watlins. I just want to make sure that based on the motion we just adopted, um, the amendment we just adopted, that any other um, clarifying administrative cleanup that needs to be done to the bill is in your court. 
Yes, thank you very much, Councilmember Lukey. Uh, correct, and along those lines, um, the additional clarification will be that the title itself to the bill, um, number six of the items with, you know, the, the long title includes an act two, and then lists the different um, goals and mechanics of the bill. Number six under that will say an act two require gun shops to display and distribute the literature period. So that will just be a clean up to the title. Um, I don't believe there are any other clarifying edits, but um, I understand the substance of, of your amendment and the final bill will reflect the amended version. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'll just say I'm very appreciative of all of the work that the Health and Human Services Committee did on this and the leadership of uh, Councilmember Glass on all the advocates who worked on this issue to advance an important public safety issue. Uh, we have a mental health crisis in our community uh, and we have an access to guns crisis in our community and when you pair those things together suicide when combined with a gun is irreversible oftentimes most times and that is something that we need to address and the more we can educate on that in the broadest sense possible to reach as many people as possible to ensure uh, that uh, we don't lose people unnecessarily uh, to this epidemic, uh, that is a positive and, and that is something that I'm proud to work with colleagues on and look forward to, uh, to advancing this uh, moving forward. Uh, let me turn it over uh, for the final word on this before we vote to the sponsor, Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you uh, to all of our my colleagues uh, for for supporting the amendment to strengthen this bill, uh, and especially to my colleagues who were original co-sponsors when it was introduced a number of months ago. Uh, the reason I introduced the Suicide Awareness and Firearm Firearms Education Act was to raise awareness uh, about suicide prevention and to urge us as a county to do more than simply express our thoughts and prayers every time we see a tragedy occur. We are in a mental health crisis. Guns are an epidemic. And unfortunately, Montgomery County is not immune to either. And the Center for Disease Control uh, continues to share tragic information that guns are the leading cause of death in the United States and deaths by suicide are increasing every year. Uh, I think the statistics have been shared, it's certainly in the packet and has been discussed, that 42 percent of deaths by suicide in the state of Maryland are by firearm. And here in Montgomery County, that figure is approximately a third. So with today's passage of the SAFE Act, we are going to make our community safer. And there is ample evidence that when people are given a message of hope, given information about how to receive the care that they need, they think again. And even if we save just one life, this legislation will be meaningful and purposeful. And that's what we are all here to do, to help protect our residents. So again, I thank my colleagues, thank Ms. Wellens. I wanna thank Moms Demand Action, every town, NAMI, Montgomery County, every mind, the office of Sheriff Max Wee for supporting this legislation. And I also want to thank my Chief of Staff, Valeria Carranza, for moving this forward uh, during our presidency. So thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you to you and your team uh, for your leadership on this. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to ask if you would like to make a motion of the amended bill. Uh, I move to move the bill. The bill has been moved as amended. There is a second by Councilmember Lukey. And we have a roll call vote. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. Council Member Jawando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Albernaz? Yes. Council Member Albernaz votes yes. Council Member Fani Gonzalez? I will abstain. Council Member Fani Gonzalez abstain. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. 
Councilmember Friesen. Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Okay, with a vote of uh, 10 in favor, uh, zero no's, and one abstention, the, uh, the bill passes. Congratulations. Okay, uh, for the next series of items uh, on our list, we have some special appropriations. And I just uh, quickly, before we uh, get into the special appropriations, and uh, I uh, turn it over, I just want to note that the, the series of appropriations that we're going to be reviewing uh, today and also the new process that we've undertaken, and uh, just uh, express my appreciation to colleagues uh, and, and especially to Council Vice President and Government Operations Chair Stewart uh, for navigating through these issues. Uh, these are uh, challenges to meet the urgent needs of our community, but to do so in a fiscally prudent way to think comprehensively about the impact on the broader budget, the uh, competing uh, challenges uh, that we have and that we face, and the joint committee structure that we have undertaken for these. I, I have participated in all of them as a member of the GEO committee, and I have found them to be thoughtful. I found them to be helpful. I think we have uh, pushed our colleagues in the executive branch to answer questions that needed to be uh, answered for the benefit of the public and for the benefit of this uh, body's deliberation. And in many cases, we have improved the appropriation and, and how they were going to, to move forward, both for uh, our uh, partners in the executive branch and for us, and also for some of the uh, external partners in the community who ultimately will be uh, the recipient in some cases uh, of these uh, funds. So I just wanted to note uh, that change. I think it is an approach that we are going to not only continue, but look to uh, implement similarly in ways that we can be as thoughtful and deliberative as possible, uh, understanding that uh, these are not our funds. These are public dollars, and uh, we owe it to the public to ask the questions, uh, to do the oversight, uh, to uh, take our responsibility uh, extremely seriously, and to make sure that we're not uh, handling things on an ad hoc or uh, a one-off uh, 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 way and, and manner. Uh, so with that, um, we have uh, item number five, action on a supplemental appropriation uh, number 2436 to the FY24 capital budget, Montgomery County Government, Office of the County uh, Executive, Business Center, Life Sciences and Technology Centers for $400,000. The source of funds is current revenue general. There was a joint uh, economic GEO committee, which recommends approval. Let me turn it over to the GEO chair uh, to speak to this. Great. Um, thank you, Councilman, uh, Council President Friedson. Um, appreciate that. Um, so just as some background, in FY22, the Council approved a project to convert vacant office spaces to wet labs at the Germantown Incubator on Montgomery College's Germantown campus. Unfortunately, as we know with construction projects uh, these days, there are delays and company cost increases um, are the basis of the county executive's request for the supplemental appropriation of four hundred thousand um, dollars. This will create ten vacant ten vacant offices will be converted into four wet labs. Um, as was noted on December fourth, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and the Economic Development Committees held a joint session. We discussed the demand for additional wet lab space, the overabundance of vacant office spaces, and the merits of this project. Um, in particular, the committee discussed the racial equity impact statements and the benefits of reducing the cost of entry into this business sector. The committee's unanimously recommended approval by those present six to zero. Appreciate that. We have a unanimous uh, committee recommendation uh, before the body. All in favor of this special appropriation, please raise your hand. That is unanimous uh, among council members. Uh, we'll now uh, move on to item number six, a special appropriation 2437 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Office of Food Systems Resilience, and Department of Health and Human Services Food Security Initiative in the amount of $11,060,000. The source of funds is general fund undesignated reserves. And there's an amendment to the FY24 operating budget, resolution 2184, section G, fiscal year 24 designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status to Capital Area Food Bank, Inc. There's a joint GEO, Health and Human Services Committee uh, recommendation, uh, which recommends approval. And with that, let me turn it uh, again to the GEO chair. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so 
This was um, a long <laughs> discussion that we had um, at our joint committee session between GO and HHS on December 1st. Um, and just to note, the um, source of these general funds is our undesignated reserves um, in over a uh, million dollars. Overall, the appropriation provides $6.5 million for the Capital Area Food Bank contract to support 51 food assistance providers to source shelf-stable food and pre-packed produce, produce boxes for distribution in Montgomery County, and more than $4.4 million in additional funding for the Office of Food Security Resilience, which will support implementation of the strategies identified in the Strategic Plan to End Childhood Hunger. Um, the Joint Committees recommend approval of this special appropriations. Uh, I want to note specifically during the meeting, myself and other members of the Government Operations Committee highlighted that the new grant programs to be facilitated uh, are being done by the Office of Food Systems Resiliency in coordination with the Office of Grants Management, and that these will need to be done in a timely way to distribute the funds to nonprofit and community organizations. Um, given that Government Operations had a separate meeting on um, talking with the Office of Grants Management and the County ex Executive office, we have had the County Exec's office assurance that these grants will be implement, implemented efficiently. Um, just as a side note, um, colleagues, you did receive a memo regarding that Government Operations Center, uh, session on uh, the Office of Grants Management, and that has also been sent to the County Exec's office. Um, Finally, I want to say I want to thank our council staff, um, Ms. Clemens Johnson and Ms. McGuire, for their excellent work on this. This was a very detailed package to put together, and I just want to say thank you for walking us through it and all your efforts on this. I also want to uh, extend my thanks to Councilmember um, Albanars and Chair of the HHS Committee um, and Director Bruskin on prioritizing and advancing the stra strategic plan to end childhood hunger. And I think with this appropriation, we're taking a huge leap forward um, to making that a reality. And I just want to lift up finally um, one of the things for the packet for everyone in the RESJ -R statement. It stated, by taking a multi-pronged approach, this special appropriations is well positioned to shrink racial and e income disparities that characterize food insecurity in the county, while simultaneously building a system that centers food sovereignty and dignity. And with the permission of the council president, um, I'd like to have Chair Albanaz also speak to this item. Sure. We'll turn it over to Councilmember Albernaz, and then I'll turn it over to Councilmember Glass. Thank you. That was an excellent summary and recap, so I won't add very much, but did want to double down on a couple of points that Council Vice President Stewart made and Council President Freitzen, that this was an excellent process, and I think this establishes a strong best practice moving forward um, when there is obvious, as there was in this case, collaboration necessary between GEO and a committee, um, because it gave us a fuller picture and there were some very thoughtful and reasonable questions raised in the packet, which was turned around very quickly, I might add, um, and done very well. And that is something we're going to have to have moving, talk about moving forward as a longer runway uh, for our team uh, to be able to be able to process really complex information. Um, but I am thrilled with the responses that Ms. Bruskin and the executive branch provided, which were thoughtful, complete, uh, and I think really dictated where this will go in a way that made us all feel not just comfortable, but confident uh, in the next phase of this very important initiative. So uh, I'm thrilled with where we landed on this. I know there will be much more work to do, and the need persists, as we know, um, but I think this is another very important step forward. Thank you for that. Thank you to both of the chairs for your work and leadership. Thank you to uh, council member and also Chair Albernaz under his Leadership as council president, the uh, strategic plan to end childhood hunger was initiated, and many of these initiatives are part of that broader effort. Really appreciate uh, your work on that. Let me turn it over to council member Class. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, too, want to extend my appreciation to the, the chairs of the two committees for, for taking the deep dive into this work, and also to Ms. Clemens Johnson uh, for uh, facilitating uh, the the in information session really um, and I followed the work of of the joint committee and absolutely uh, know that this is the right thing to do that food insecurity has not waned uh, it has only uh, 
been exacerbated uh, post-pandemic, and we have to make sure that our residents uh, are healthy and fed. Uh, with that, I, I just do have some general questions, uh, and I'm, I'm just scanning the room. I'm not sure any of the other principals from, from the administration are here, um, if someone is hiding. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so, Ms. Clemens Johnson, it might be uh, directed to you and answered to your, the best of your ability. I know the $11 million is essentially being uh, uh, divided up to 21 small-scale small uh, food assistance providers. Uh, do, have we been told what the, the metrics are or what the, the basis for those 21 uh, organizations might be? Um. No, <laughs> but for clarification, um, Capital Area Food Bank is not able to fund those 21 providers based on whatever structure they have of eligibility. And so Mana Food Center is going to be providing those um, 21 providers the same assistance that they had previously through the Food Staples Program. So um, so they, they, Capital Area Food Bank and Mana, and Mana are still the main distributors. They just have split the organizations that they are funding. And so those, the organizations that are being funded are ones that already have the contracts with those two larger uh, regional nonprofits to, to provide smaller scale uh, 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 um, programs? Correct. And as I understand it within Capital Area's Food Bank, um, there is a small amount of funding to help onboard some new providers that they have. We didn't get the detailed list. And, um, during the committee discussion, we did ask for that information, and I will follow up to ensure we receive that. But um, so there are a few new providers, um, but we do not know exactly who they Fantastic. are. Fantastic, and I know that it was asked in committee. Just wanted to re up it uh, for for the full council because I think one of the things that we always try to grapple with in government, uh, particularly within the nonprofit space is supporting the organizations that have grown and have clearly demonstrated leadership and ability. And while there are those organizations, there are new organizations that start up and find, uh, find an unmet need, because there is always a new unmet need, especially in a growing and diverse community like ours. And trying to figure out the, 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 the parameters, the algorithm uh, for disbursement of these funds and thinking it through so that uh, should we need to do another supplemental or uh, increase these funds in the base budget uh, that there is a full understanding among all the uh, organizations in this space of how they can support the shared goal. So I, I appreciate you uh, following up with the administration to, to collect these answers uh, and uh, fully support this and uh, appreciate the pre council president for allowing me to ask these questions. Appreciate that. And I uh, just want to acknowledge as well the terrific work by staff, Ms. Clemens Johnson, Ms. McGuire as well, who is somewhere here. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate uh, all the work that you did under a, a tight time frame. Let me turn it over to Council Member Fani Gonzalez. It's very quickly. Um, I just wanted to uplift a couple of things that are part of these special appropriations that actually speaks about our values as a county. This is really important work, and, and the fact that the county executive and the county council are joining forces on this speaks highly of us as a government. Um, I would like to highlight the there are four grants programs, and one of them is the community school distributions and pantries, and um, one of the groups that gets you know, that benefits from this is actually the the food distribution center in Wheaton uh, at the Hughes Methodist Church. The need is enormous. And, uh, and I know this grant will help them big time. But the other one that I'm very excited about is the food gardening grant program. I'm really passionate about urban um, farming and I'm working in, on two projects in my district and this will be this grant will be very helpful for one of them at Loverman Middle School, which is in my district. It's, a, it's in a neighborhood that has high number of low-income communities. Um, and, and the fact that we're doing this, it's not just about giving food to people, but also teaching children how to grow food. You know, um, and that's a beautiful thing, and I'm very proud of it. So thank you for all your work. Thank you, Council Rajwanda. Thank you. Um, also, just really happy to support this one of the 
thank uh, my colleagues on GO and HHS, and particularly the chair of HHS. Uh, this is something uh, he and I have been working on for a while. I, I just looked up the date. Uh, in June of 2020, this council put forward a $10 million appropriation on food. It was our first food appropriation. Uh, it led to the creation of these hubs and uh, all of uh, some of the food sites you talked about. And I'll never forget getting a call from like the police chief, the county exec CAO, uh, and the head of recreation the night before our first mass food distribution, which we had never done mm -hmm. in Montgomery County uh, three and a half years ago. Worried about logistics in the middle of COVID and were people going to be standing far from each other. And now we have the Office of, of, Foods, of Food System Resiliency. We have a plan. Uh, led by Councilman Bravanaz and, and, and others to end childhood hunger. Uh, this is a commitment nationally that is uh, unmatched that I've seen. Uh, and it just makes me really happy that because the need persists, that we are not only meeting immediate needs, but we are looking to change systemically how we address uh, food insecurity for our most vulnerable. So uh, couldn't be prouder to support this and have played a role in, in, in getting us to this point. Uh, and I'm just glad we're continuing it. So. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Councilmember Juwanda, I remember being at the East County Rec Center together for the, the big announcement uh, with, with you and, and Councilmember Albernaz. And uh, it is uh, feels like a couple decades ago, <laughs> frankly. I was thinking back about it this, uh, this morning, but it's hard to believe that it was only a, a few years ago. And certainly there's a lot more work to be done, but a lot of progress that has been made. Uh, I will note uh, some of the conversation during this discussion uh, from myself and others uh, was the need to budget and plan in advance. Uh, we got an annual budget request that really only covered six months, which is really not a way for us to be moving forward to, to plan for the future. It's not fair to our partners who don't know what money is coming and when. It's not uh, reasonable from a fiscal stewardship standpoint of not really understanding what uh, the fiscal realities are going to be. An annual budget should be an annual appropriation. And if there are emergency needs that come up, we address them uh, at the appropriate time. I think it was uh, taken uh, in, in the manner in which it was, uh, it was presented by the executive branch uh, on that. And as we head into the budget, I think it's important that we have these conversations, that we not uh, put forward appropriations knowing that they don't meet uh, the, the expectations uh, and then putting uh, us in a situation mid-year where we're making uh, you know, decisions somewhat on, on the fly. Uh, and so that's obviously what we want to get out of. We started doing that a lot during COVID because we needed to and we were dealing with federal dollars. Uh, as we are moving away from uh, federal dollars, it's just not a way that we can manage our budget process and it's something that we need to get out of that trend. I think the process that we've set up here has started to institutionalize the changes of how we're going to deal with these issues, but uh, we need to be working closely with our executive branch partners to make sure that uh, we're collaborating on that front. So uh, with that, uh, I don't see any other colleagues wishing to speak. We have a joint committee recommendation. All those in favor of this special appropriation, 2437, please raise your hand. Uh, that is unanimous. Um, we're going to move on. We have a couple more uh, special appropriations, um, and then we have a public hearing coming up. I just want to note we're running a few minutes behind for the public hearing, so anybody who's here uh, for that, uh, hopefully we can uh, get to that uh, shortly. Uh, this is item number seven, action on a special appropriation 2439 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, Respite Center for Arriving Migrants Grant Program, SAMU Foundation, $2.261663 million. The source of fund is general fund undesignated reserves. There's a joint GEO P, uh, public safety health and human services committee, uh, which recommends approval given that it was a triple committee. Hopefully there's not a lot of outstanding questions, comments, or concerns, but with that, let me turn it over to the GEO committee chair. Thank you. Yes, this was a, uh, a, a trifecta of uh, committees uh, and, uh, and we unanimously rem 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 uh, re recommended approval of uh, 
this appropriations. Um, basically, what this will do is fund respite services, including emergency shelter, food, and transportation services for arriving migrants to Montgomery County through the SAMU Foundation. Uh, this increase is needed to continue uh, the county respite center services from um, January to June of 2024 um, that to date have been funded through um, Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA funds that um, were being used for this. These services were made available um, from June 2022 through December of 2023 through FEMA's Emergency Food and Shelter Program. Uh, unfortunately, the SAMU Foundation um, informed the county that its current FEMA funding through the United Way will end December 31st, 2023. Based on testimony from the Office of the County Executive and the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, the Joint Committees agreed that this appropriation will be an emergency grant provided to SAMU due to the abrupt end of FEMA funding. The committee recommends maximizing state funds that may become available to support the respite center as the state of Maryland finance finalizes its funding support for jurisdictions providing services to migrant individuals and families. And I know there are already meetings happening between the executive branch and representatives from the state on this. Um, I want to underscore, as we uh, stated in our committee meetings, that the actions that Montgomery County took in 2022 um, as the first jurisdiction in this region to open a respite center for individuals who are being bused here was critical. Um, we, we really showed leadership here. Uh, many of the jurisdictions, not just in our, in our region, but around the country are unfortunately struggling with this. And by having a respite center where people could go get medical care, and find out how to get to their next de designation because many of the individuals who are coming here do have somewhere else to go in the United States um, was critical to meet their need. Um, and again, I just want to um, thank uh, Council Member Albanaz, who was Council President, when we started to receive uh, migrants in our region. Um, I was the mayor in the city of Tacoma Park at that time, and he really stepped up as did Dr. Stardard and um, the county executive, um, and they took quick action to address this um, crisis. And I've had the opportunity to visit this respite center, and I can't tell you how proud it makes me of Montgomery County, the fact that we stood up um, and showed this leadership. And so I'm thrilled to have us um, put this emergency grant. Um, again, we are looking for other funds um, to sustain this. Um, but I'm uh, glad to share that the committee uh, unanimously recommended this. And again, uh, I'd ask that the council president turns it over to uh, Chair Albanaz of the HHS committee. Let me turn it over to Chair Albanaz. I want to thank him for all of his leadership, not just on this uh, particular issue, but in general on uh, one of the most vexing challenges that we are facing in our region and, and throughout the country. I know he's been to the border. I know that he has been uh, there uh, with buses that have arrived into our community. He's been there on the front lines uh, working with our Health and Human Services and emergency management folks to try to address the acute needs of some very vulnerable people in our community to make sure that we uh, weren't allowing anybody to fall uh, outside the, the, the safety net that, that we pride ourselves on. And I just really appreciate his leadership. Let me turn it over to him. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, once again, Council Vice President Stewart said it well. I do also want to acknowledge Delegate Charcutian, who's been a tremendous leader at the state's level, uh, helping to connect local jurisdictions and being a true leader in this and many other spaces. But uh, this is an instance in which Montgomery County is shining. Uh, we are showing the entire country the way that we should be doing this in dealing with a woefully broken federal immigration system that is not of our doing. Uh, but as a result of those challenges, we are continuing to see uh, incredible individuals risking their lives uh, and doing things that are unimaginable to come here. And it makes all the sense in the world for us to welcome them, um, for us to lean in and provide services before they are in complete crisis uh, and address those uh, needs head on. So thank you to all of my colleagues, both current and former um, who've been tremendous leaders in this. This is yet another example of why living, I love living in this community. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll just note, as I said during the triple joint committee mm -hmm. session, this is a federal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Montgomery County is stepping up, hoping that the state 
uh, ultimately uh, fills uh, much or all of the gap. Uh, but it is the job of the federal government to provide these services, and we are stepping up in a moral capacity on a human level with public dollars to address this issue. But I do not want us to lose sight at all, ever, of the fact that we continue to call on the federal government in this case and in so many related cases to do its job. And in this particular case, Montgomery County is stepping up, uh, but we're being forced to step up because the federal government uh, has failed uh, to do their responsibility in this particular case. And that has been an ongoing challenge and something that we're going to continue to advocate for. I will continue to push for it. I know our state and our uh, other partners are, are doing so uh, uh, as well. Uh, with that, we have a joint committee, triple committee recommendation. All those in favor of this special appropriation 2439, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Uh, now we have uh, item eight, special appropriation 2414 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Housing and Community Affairs, uh, related to the implementation of the rent stabilization bill for the amount of 1.374,470. And uh, the source of funds is general fund uh, reserves. Uh, we have a joint PHP GO committee uh, recommendation. Let me turn it over to the GO chair. Great. This is the last one of the day. <laughs> right, for background, uh, in July, uh, the County Council passed Bill 15-23, the Landlord-Tenant Relations Rent Stabilization Bill. And as part of the bill's requirements, the Department of Housing and Community Affairs will be responsible for reviewing and, appro and approving certain rent increases, grant exemptions, and generally managing the program. Um, as such, the council has received this special appropriations. Um, there was the joint committee meeting on December 4th. Um, the joint committee recommends uh, four to one with Council President Friedson opposing to approve the special appropriations. Um, and what this includes is money for nine full-time equivalent positions and money for operating expenses. The personnel costs assumed um, were revised um, to start in March. March of 2024. The committees did have a robust conversation with the director of DHCA regarding um, the personnel issues and the ability of the department to hire um, that many full-time um, positions at one time um, and this spring. Um, and again, the, it, this was a recommendation four to one by the joint committee to approve this appropriation. Uh, thank you for that. I'll just uh, note um, my objection was not related to relitigating the legislation that was approved, but my uh, questions and uh, degree of skepticism of the ability to hire nine people in a three-month span and whether or not the uh, level of appropriation was uh, realistic or uh, necessary based on those concerns. And so I respect uh, the uh, views that uh, colleagues had in approving this, but. Uh, decided uh, that uh, I uh, was not comfortable with, with that and, and, and voted, uh, voted no uh, on that. Uh, so you heard we have a committee recommendation. I do not see any uh, colleagues wishing to speak. Uh, all those in favor of this special appropriation, please raise your hand. All those opposed, that is approved 10 to 1 uh, with me objecting. And with that, we are ready to move on uh, to our public hearing. So the council is now going to sit as the Board of Health. Uh, we have a public hearing on a resolution to adopt Bill 4223, Health and Sanitation, Menstrual Products, and Public Restrooms required as a Board of Health regulation. This is a public hearing on a resolution to adopt Bill 4223, uh, Health and Sanitation, Menstrual Products, and Public Restrooms. A joint economic development and health and human services work session is currently scheduled for February 1st, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business on January 25th, 2024. Uh, we have uh, several speakers. Uh, the first group is Hannah Solomon, Laura Stewart, Jumka Gupta, Jacqueline Lindsay here. Please join us at the table. We're going to go in the order that I just called your names. Hannah Solomon, when you're ready. 
can hit your button and you have three minutes. Hello and good morning members of the County Council. My name is Hannah Solomon. I'm a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. I live in the Silver Spring area. I'm a co-founder of the period chapter at my school and today I'm here to speak to you in support of the resolution for Bill 4223, a bill that would require public places of accommodation to provide menstrual products free of charge in certain public restrooms, and a bill that we have up until this point failed to truly discuss and acknowledge the importance of. A couple months of months ago, I met with other students to discuss menstrual equity in our county. Many felt very strongly that the implementation of menstrual product dispensers in our school was an absolutely integral step in achieving menstrual equity in the county. And attending a school that has successfully implemented free menstrual product dispensers, I can personally attest to their effectiveness. I, however, believe with the utmost conviction that there are further steps we can take in actualizing this long-time goal of realizing full menstrual equity through the passage of the resolution for Bill 4223. A study conducted by BMC Women's Health in 2021 revealed that many young women struggle to afford menstrual health products to meet their monthly needs, which correspondingly negatively impacts their well-being. Results of the study reveal that 14.2% of women had experienced poverty or the struggle that many low-income women and girls face while trying to afford period products uh, that year. Those women were most likely to report moderate or severe depression as well. A, st a state of the period study conducted this year revealed that among teens, nearly one in four have struggled to afford period products and nearly 44% reported having felt embarrassment or stress due to a lack of access to menstrual hygiene products. Menstrual hygiene as deemed by the United Nations is a human right, which for many has been overlooked for several years. For the women whose lack of access to menstrual products has affected their mental well-being, for the young girls who feel shame or embarrassment at not being able to get period products, for those who struggle to afford a basic human right, I implore that we continue to consider the impact of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Laura Stewart, three minutes. My name is Laura Stewart and I'm here representing myself, a 52-year-old menstruating woman. I ask, why don't we treat women and people who have periods the same as the rest of the population? Men, I just want you to imagine yourself having to keep toilet paper around with you wherever you went and you had to do this for 40 years. We all expect businesses to provide that necessity along with soap and a way to dry our hands. All of these products cost money, yet we still expect them in bathrooms. Period products are basic hygiene needs in the bathroom. I challenge you to find one woman that hasn't been caught off guard by unexpected bleeding in their life. Why do we accept this lack of access? There are other reasons to provide pre free period products, including the fact that most um, that the cost to financially insecure women and families often create barriers in society. Maryland went a step forward by requiring that schools provide period products. Girls can go to school and get the product without having the embarrassment of asking a school nurse, which makes it seem like that having a period is a medical condition. By the way, having a period is not a medical condition. It is normal life for a quarter of the people walking around you that get periods. We need to normalize menstruation. It isn't a mystery. It doesn't need to be treated as something to talk about in hushed tones. When a person who menstruates enters a bathroom, they should be assured that they can access materials that they need just to live their lives normally. Recently, I was in a hotel and was running low on tampons, and I needed one more for insurance. I went to the little desk store to see if they sold them and was disappointed that I didn't see that little overpriced box. So I asked the clerk and he pointed to the public bathroom in the hotel and told me that they were in there in a free dispenser. I actually felt like I was part of a society that cared for women. I didn't have to walk the mile up the road to the store and I didn't have to pay three times the normal amount because of hotel prices. I did feel sheepish asking the clerk, but that is because of the way we treat menstruation in society. It is time we fix that, and it's finally time we treat women and people that menstruate equally by providing basic hygiene and basic hygiene when it has to do with bodily fluids. We need to meet these needs in our public bathrooms.
please pass Bill 4223 and the public health resolution. Thank you for listening to me, and thank you because I actually have my period today. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you, um, and Junka Gupta. Thank you for allowing me to speak today in support of the resolution. I'm associate professor at George Mason University's College of Public Health and a researcher focusing on health equity and also a resident of Montgomery County. Research on the public health impacts of not having access to menstrual products is accumulating, and I have conducted some of the leading studies in this arena. In our 2021 study published in BMC Women's Health with college students, 400 across the United States, we found that 14% reported struggling to afford menstrual products in the year before the study. An additional 10% reported struggling to afford menstrual products on a monthly basis. As a county, we are concerned about mental health. In our study, struggling to afford menstrual products was associated with depression. Specifically, those who reported difficulty with accessing menstrual products on a monthly basis were nearly three times more likely to report depressive symptoms than those without period poverty. I share these findings to showcase that period poverty can impact any member of our society. In addition to mental health, there are also concerns about infection for leaving products in for too long, as well as disruptions to missing work, class, or any other social or critical engagement in public life. Similar to other pressing public health issues, the most vulnerable communities are most impacted. People with certain medical conditions, such as endometriosis, which impacts one in 10 women, or uterine fibroids, these women can have heavier periods as well as unpredictable flows. So having products available in public places can help. In our study, students who are black, Latina, or born outside of the US or the first in their family to go to college reported the most challenges with accessing menstrual products. These communities stand to benefit. The availability of menstrual products is vital for ensuring the health, dignity, and full participation of menstruators in our county's public life. And the availability of menstrual products should be just as ubiquitous as toilet paper is. These are both basic needs. Making menstrual products available in public places is an important public health strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Lindsay. Council President Friedson and members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the Menstrual Products Access and Equity <clears throat> Act, introduced by Council Member Jawando, which would provide the provision of free menstrual products in certain restrooms at places of public accommodation. My name is Jacqueline Lindsay, and I'm the interim executive director of the Greater DC Diaper Bank. Our vision is to provide basic necessities that aren't covered by government programs such as food stamps and WIC. We serve 38,000 families annually in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and we distribute approximately 850,000 diapers each month. Just as importantly, we distribute hundreds of thousands of products each year to help combat period poverty through a network of 75 partners throughout the DC region. To date, in 2023, we have distributed a total of 290,943 period products, pads, tampons, and liners to 20 partners in Montgomery County, which includes seven county service consolidation hubs. I'm pleased to be in front of you today supporting the bill. Menstrual hygiene is linked closely to overall physical health and mental wellness and access to mental hygiene products is an equity issue that affects many of our most vulnerable residents. According to the Maryland Community Act Partnership Self Sustainability Calculator, a family of one adult and one infant living in Montgomery County, Maryland is considered self-sufficient. That is, they can provide for their basic family needs without private or public assistance if they earn $94,675 annually. For a family of one adult 
With one infant and one preschooler, that number rises to $132,649. For context, 98% of the families we serve are living on $50,000 each year, with the majority of them having a single head of household. 80% of that subset are living on even less, only $20,000 a year. At an average cost of $20 per cycle, the price of hygiene quickly adds up, putting a strain on household budgets already thin. If you are someone who has ever menstruated, you know that period products are necessities like toilet paper and water. The county provides toilet paper, soap, paper towels, and other needed hygiene items in public buildings. So do private um, businesses in their restrooms and period products are just as vital to personal hygiene as toilet paper. Without proper access to hygiene items, those who menstruate are likely to use products past the point of sanitary use, which puts them at higher risk for infection. Lack of these products prevents from them from leaving home. According to the Alliance for Period Supplies, one in three in low-income women have missed work, school, or outings due to a lack of menstrual products. Thank you for the opportunity, and the Greater D.C. Diaper Bank supports this bill. Thank you very much. I believe we have Lulu August, who is on virtual and speaking to both this and the next item. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. My name is Lulu August. I use the pronouns she and her, and I'm a proud graduate of Richard Montgomery High School and a current second year at Harvard. And today I'm speaking in favor of the Menstrual Products Access, Equ Access and Equity Act. Um, imagine if every time you went to a public restroom, you had to carry with you a roll of toilet paper, a bottle of clean water, a bar of soap, and maybe a roll of paper towels for good measure. And strangely in this scenario, there's this weird social stigma around anyone seeing you carry these items, even though you need them for your basic health needs. So usually you just kind of shove it up your sleeve and pray that nobody notices. And then there's those awful days when you accidentally forget to pack these items and suddenly you're left scrambling to discreetly borrow each from a friend. I'll stop there. <laughs> this scenario is absurd. And yet this is the same absurdity we expect menstruators to deal with every day. Given that over 50% of people have, do, or will menstruate, there is just no reason why menstrual products are not widely accessible in Montgomery County. I found, and a lot of people have found, that when women and genderqueer people speak up about issues that are important to them, we have a societal tendency to dismiss the issue as too costly or too inconvenient or too low of a priority. But as many of the speakers before me have shown, this bill couldn't be more urgent. According to a study from the Journal of Global Health Reports, about 16.9 million menstruating women in the United States live in poverty, and about two-thirds of them struggle to access these often exp expensive and inaccessible menstrual products. So passing the Menstrual Products Access and Equity Act is crucial to tackling period poverty in our community, a topic that is heavily stigmatized and under-researched. Indeed, the Positive Racial Equity and Social Justice Impact Statement for this bill supports that, quote, increasing access to free menstrual products in places of public accommodation would especially benefit lower income community members who are more likely to be Black or Latinx. Um, we're not asking for luxury here, we're just asking for a bare minimum. And for me, this bill is a bit personal. When I was younger, like a lot of people in the room, I used to be terrified to talk about periods. So being here today is leaps and bounds. <laughs> Luckily, I was a high school student during a really exhilarating time of youth-led advocacy that led MCPS and the state government to mandate the provision of menstrual products in public schools. I remember feeling so empowered to unlearn my sense of period shame and to feel that my basic needs were being addressed with the dignity they deserve. And then this summer, I hope to build upon this momentum by proposing this legislation as an intern in Councilmember Jawando's office. Shout out to the Jawando mm -hmm. office. Um, after all, your period doesn't stop when you graduate from high school, so we shouldn't treat it that way. And I'll just end with a small anecdote here. Um, whenever I come across new people on campus, I always feel so proud to tell them that I'm from Montgomery County, not DC, 
not Baltimore, Montgomery County, because I'm really proud of the council we have that continually strives for equity in all sectors, whether it's gender or health, through really impactful legislation. And I see no reason why passing this bill should be an exception. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Before we close this public hearing, let me turn it to Council Member Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Um, I, uh, when listening to Ms. Lindsay uh, and, and explaining your programs uh, throughout the region, and thank you very much to you and, and the organization, did you, did you say that you do provide menstrual products in, uh, to hubs and, and to other organizations? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. I, I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate everybody coming to testify on this item, this public, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Juwando. Yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to thank the, everyone for testifying, but especially uh, Lulu uh, August, who I don't know if she's still there, but our former intern, very proud of you. I'm tearing up up here, um, but uh, wish you the best in school and really appreciate all the testimony. Thank you. Appreciate that and appreciate Hannah, you joining us as well. Thanks so much. I like the RM merch. Uh, you're rocking, so uh, appreciate that. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, please. Councilmember Mick. Real quick, also just wanted to uh, to thank um, Lulu for uh, for bringing this to us and starting a, a really important conversation, and for and for all of the speakers for um, everything that you're doing to destigmatize the conversation about uh, menstruating and having periods and all of those things. Uh, wherever this bill lands, I think we can already say that that in and of itself has great value. So thank you so much, and uh, look forward to more conversation on this important topic. Appreciate that. Okay, we have now reclosed and closed and closed again that public hearing. Uh, uh, this is uh, now our next item, uh, related public hearing on Bill 4223, Health and Sanitation, Menstrual Products and Public Restrooms Required. This bill would require places of public accommodation to provide menstrual products in certain public restrooms at no charge to users and generally amend the law regarding the provision of necessary health and sanitary products. A joint economic development and health and human services work session is currently scheduled for February 1st, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business on January 25th, 2024. We have several speakers, including in person and virtual. We're going to start with those who are here in person. Stacy Sauter, Liliana Katz Hollander, Matt Libber, Lizette Engel, Marilyn Massey Ball, if you could come up to the table. I'm going to call you up in the order that I just announced your names. Once you are ready, we'll start with Stacy Sauter. Good morning. I'm Stacy Sauter, and I thank you for this opportunity to testify today regarding 4223. I am against it. I am not here on behalf of any organization, rather I am here to speak on behalf of common sense. To start, managing the needs of one's body for, starts young for girls, but part of growing up is learning to anticipate your physical needs. And, being, and part of being a grown up is not expecting the county's nanny state to take care of all your personal needs when out in public. Certainly there are places such as public schools and prisons where dispensing these supplies for free makes sense. But if you're adding this burden to businesses when they're already fleeing this area and or are deeply reluctant to start a business here, you are adding one more nick to their death by a thousand cuts, particularly in restaurants where, they're, where you are already trying to squeeze them by increasing the minimum wage for servers. Supplies such as toilet paper, soap, and towels are already baked into the cost of doing business, especially when profitable margins are increasingly hard to maintain. But adding feminine products? Why would anyone bother to buy tampons or pads if they could just grab them for free anytime they want in a business that's required to stock them up? And if you can afford to be eating out, presumably you can afford to buy a box of tampons. And how do you control or account for the products? Providing them could add a significant line item for the restaurants. Are you going to set up a period police that monitors restrooms to make sure there's an adequate supply? Are the period police going to level fines if there's no supply? In addition, restaurant owners already have their share of grift. 
things that are not nailed down tend to get stolen, and not just salt shakers, but toilet paper. Are you willing to adequately subsidize the businesses for this mandated expense? Because supplies are at high risk of being stolen. And if you're providing free pads and tampons, why stop there? As a friend of mine shared, will adult diapers be next? Why not provide those for free? How about free condoms in all the men's rooms? If not so serious in the long-term scheme of things, this bill would be laughable, which is why I'd like to respectfully and seriously suggest that the county not pass this bill in favor of common sense. Thank you for this opportunity, and happy holidays. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liliana Katz-Hollander. Hello, and thank you all for your time today. My name is Liliana Katz-Hollander, and I live in Kensington. Uh, I am a student at Richard Montgomery High School, where I am the president of a club branch of the National Organization for Women, as well as Period. Um, and I'm the co-chair of MOCO Empower, which is an MCPS-affiliated organization that works to um, uplift and support female and non-binary students in Montgomery County. I am here to speak to you today regarding a very taboo topic periods. Uh, there are countless reasons why I'm speaking in support of Bill 4223 today, but I will speak on three of the most important. One is public health. Access to menstrual products is, at its core, a public health issue. According to the NIH, without proper access to menstrual products, menstruators make use of other objects that could absorb or collect blood or, as previously said, continue to use products past their point. We would never permit a business to charge for toilet paper or to not stock it at all. We would also never expect people to walk around carrying a roll of toilet paper or soap or towels. That is because they, like period products, are necessary hygienic items. We are unable to control the flow of our periods and we should not have to carry bags of tampons and pads around at all times. Number two. Equity. Period products can cost up to $20 a cycle, according to the National Organization for Women, and lack of access can prevent women from working and attending events. This is especially an issue for low-income menstruators, as well as those who are suffering from homelessness. It is amazing that we provide period products in school, but periods do not stop at graduation. Requiring public places to stock period products is not the factor that will make or break these businesses economically. Three. Equality. Over the course of a lifetime, women spend thousands of dollars on period products, five to 18,000 depending on your source. This is money we are required to spend as we are again unable to control our periods that men do not. Maryland guarantees equal rights under the law regarding sex via our state constitution and has since 1972. This issue clearly qualifies. Menstruators are already displaced economically due to the wage gap, discriminatory hiring practices, and the additional economic strain of menstrual products, which are, as I emphasize again, involuntary. This bill has been described as unprecedented, and that, council members, is exactly why it must become law. MOCO is known as a progressive leader, and passing this bill will no doubt inspire a wave of change throughout the region, state, and country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Matt Liver. Uh, Councilman Fritzen, uh, congratulations on your recent election as uh, Council President, members of the Council. Thanks for having me here. Uh, for the record, Matt Liber, Executive Director of Maryland Soccer Plex. Um, I'm, I understand the intent of the bill. I'm here for it. I know it's an issue we need to address. Um, some of my objections are just the mechanisms within the bill. Um, the cost is definitely an issue. Um, as a nonprofit, I looked at the prices of doing this. We have a lot of bathrooms on property. It's adding twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars to our bottom line in year one. Um, I get it. It's it's something that we need to move towards. But right now, it's an unfunded mandate from the council. I think the council, the county, needs to have some skin in the game and help businesses like us to transition to this change. Um, I think it's only fair that we get some leeway, a six-month leeway. Our budget's already set, so this isn't in our budgets right now. So we just need some help to make this work. Um, the other concern I have is from a legal standpoint, a liability standpoint, because these are free products, we have no way to track who takes them. If there is an issue with this product, that puts us on the hook. If there's a recall for a product, we have no means to let anyone know that there's a recall on this product because we don't know who took them. If something happens, if they want to sue, now I'm on the hook for that liability to defend myself in that. So I think that needs to be an amendment to the bill to give us some liability protection for someone taking products from our business that we have no control over. Um, I do have concerns with one of the other speakers about these products 
freely getting taken out of the, the space when they're not necessarily needed. I don't know how to address that one. That, that's just a very hard thing to, to account for. People are going to take it. They do it now. They steal toilet paper. They take hand sanitizer, soap. They're less expensive. Feminine products are very expensive, which is why we're addressing the problem. We just need to figure out how to account for that moving forward. But right now, we just need help to implement this, and I'm asking for some consideration for funding support from the county to help us transition to this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lizette Engel. Hi, thank you for having me here. My name is Lisette Oriana Engel, she, her, Aya, a resident of Germantown, but I'm here in my capacity as a member of the Montgomery County Community Action Board, the federal, state, and locally designated anti-poverty group. And we are here to strongly support Bill 4223. This crucial legislation reflects a commitment to promoting public health, hygiene, and gender equity within our community. Access to menstrual products is a basic human right, and it directly impacts the well-being and dignity of individuals who menstruate. Unfortunately, the lack of available products in public restrooms can lead to significant challenges for those who unexpectedly find themselves without the necessary supplies. Yes, this does happen. The legislation is an excellent first step in addressing a lesser known poverty, period poverty, which is a term used for those struggling to access menstrual hygiene products. Period poverty disproportionately affects low-income individuals and those of colors, students and others who may face financial barriers to purchasing these products regularly, as we know that they are not covered by SNAP or other public benefits. A 2021 study by you by Cot by, of you by Cotex demonstrated that two in five people struggle to afford supplies, and with recent inflation, we know that that number may be even higher now. Not having access to hygiene supplies causes people to miss work or school, impacting their quality of life or their ability to be able to give back to our community. Period poverty can be especially challenging in an area like Montgomery County, where the cost of living is so high. The 2023 Montgomery County Self-Sufficiency Standard for a household with one adult, one preschooler, and one school-age child is an annual income of over $116,000, over four and a half times the federal poverty level. This adult is spending all their money, over half their money on rent and income and child care. Less than 8% of other income can be allocated to miscellaneous items, including a cell phone or purchasing these products. By mandating the provision of menstrual products in public restrooms, Bill 4223 addresses a fundamental aspect of public health and sanitation. Menstrual hygiene is, an essential, is essential for preventing infections and maintaining overall well-being. By taking this proactive step, our county can contribute to the creation of a more inclusive, supportive environment for everybody, regardless of gender or socioeconomic status, and become a leader in the state, but also and join also jurisdictions across the country who are already providing the services in their jurisdictions. Moreover, ensuring access to menstrual products in public restrooms aligns with the broader efforts to break down barriers and reduce stigma surrounding menstruation and address economic inequity as these products would be available to any menstruating person. This bill sends a powerful message that our community values the health and dignity of all its members, regardless of gender identity or socioeconomic status. For this, the board proudly supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Is Marilyn Massey Ball here with us? She is not here with us. Okay, that is all of our in-person speakers. We appreciate you joining us today. We're gonna to turn it to our virtual speakers, uh, starting with Sarah Bella Johnson. I think we're having some audio issues. Hello, can you hear there me? There you my go. Name is yep, Sarah we can Bella hear Johnson. you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Bella Johnson, and I am the founder of My Period Bag Uh. Because let's be honest, sometimes periods can be uh. Today, let me walk you down memory lane. Imagine the year is 2021. Imagine being tall, short, old, young or season to perfection, let's be honest. Imagine being a pimple-faced kid struggling to get out of bed each morning. You finally make your way up out of bed. You turn on the news and you're shocked. But please, your age bracket has just been selected for the highly anticipated COVID shock. You grab your phone, your license, and you head down to your nearest health department on York Road. The next few days will shock you. It isn't the chills or the flu from the shot that you got. It's the increase in your period blood from your COVID shot that you received. Let's be honest, I budgeted 
for all of my essentials. I budgeted for housing, I budgeted for food, utilities, and I was even lucky enough to put away seven or eight dollars for a box of pads. And now I'm leaking through my last pad. <sighs> I'm at school, I'm at work, I'm on a bench in the park. What do I do? Who do I talk to? Who do I ask for help? Fear overcomes me, my anxiety level increases, and my depression sets in. See, you don't carry change with you. I mean, who carries 50 cent in a digital land? You know, I don't have a coin case quarter ready to slide into a machine in a public restroom to get a tampon or a pad, even though I do have a couple cents. No, see, I, I visibly see the blood on my panty. I see the blood leaking through my pants. I feverishly grab for the tissue in the restroom that is available free, and I'm stuffing it into my panties. But, shocker, it's not working. I remember the sock, the sock hat from my Aunt Valerie. She says, take off your sock, put it in your underwear, and you'll make it until you can get to your next pad. And I think this is great. But I look down at my feet, and I look down at my feet and my unmanicured toes, and the feet that I promised that, you know, I would paint my toes before I put down my wore down sandals, but I didn't. So as I'm sitting there in period blood, I pull up my panties, my wet, bloody mess of defeat. I feel defeated, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this committee, this committee of human beings today that will change and eliminate period poverty for me. Cause let's be honest, Pads, tampons, reusable Bella pads, those are not luxury. Those are part of the movement that I hope we all agree to change, the movement to provide period dignity back to all that menstruate. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zoe Kraft. Good morning, council members. Um, my name is Zoe Kraft, and I serve as the manager of legislative policy for the Alliance for Period Supplies. I'm proud to be here with you all today to testify virtually in support of Bill 4223, sponsored by Councilmember Jawando. As a program of the National Diaper Bank Network, the Alliance for Period Supplies is a national network of more than 120 independently operated organizations that collect, warehouse, and distribute millions of period supplies every year in their local communities helping to serve individuals, children, and families who struggle to afford basic material necessities. Right here in Maryland, three of our member programs are hard at work to address period poverty, which is the inability to purchase enough period products due to lack of income. Across the nation, two in five women struggle with this issue, which has been shown to negatively impact both the physical and mental health and well-being of people who are unable to access the products that they need. Bill 4223 is critical to advancing equitable access to free menstrual products for people with periods across Montgomery County. The passage of this bill would have a profound impact on individuals who struggle to afford menstrual products by ensuring that these basic necessities are readily available in public restrooms across the county. The Alliance for Period Supplies stands in strong support of this important measure that would not only remove barriers to accessing menstrual products, but would also work to address period poverty, an issue that impacts the lives of countless Montgomery County residents while furthering the more just, equitable society that we believe is possible. We strongly believe that no student should miss school, no adult should miss work, and no person should miss out on daily life simply because they're unable to afford the basic necessities that we all require to thrive. But while we sit here right now, there are members of our community that are being forced to risk their health by using socks or wads of toilet paper to substitute for the products that they can't access and can't afford. So today, I urge you to support Bill 4223 to advance equitable access to menstrual products and set a precedent for other communities to follow. Thank you so much for your time and for allowing me to testify on such an important matter. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, our next speaker is Joyce Lynn and Jinga. Good afternoon. My name is Joyce Lynn Jinga. I'm a resident of Montgomery County. 
and I'm representing Mila Giving, the nonprofit initiative of Mila dedicated to promoting accessible menstrual hygiene. I'm here today not just as an advocate for change, but as a voice for equality and inclusivity in support of Bill 4223 on health and sanitation, menstrual products, and public restrooms. Menstruation is a natural part of life for half of the world's population and hundreds of thousands of people in Montgomery County, yet issues related to menstruation are often not discussed publicly or given the necessary platform to address them. The lack of access to menstrual products remains a significant barrier for many. Improving access is more than a matter of convenience, it's a matter of naked dignity, equity, and basic human rights. Through Mila, we've witnessed firsthand the challenges faced by individuals who struggle to access menstrual products in public spaces. These challenges can hinder education, limit opportunities, and perpetuate inequalities. No one should have to compromise their health or dignity due to the absence of something as basic as menstrual products in public facilities. Bill 4223 is not just a legislative proposal, it's a beacon of progress, signaling a commitment, <laughs> a signaling commitment to a more inclusive and compassionate society. Mandating the presence of menstrual products in public restrooms is a crucial step towards breaking down barriers and ensuring that individuals can move through life without unnecessary obstacles. I urge broad support of this bill to ensure that public restrooms in our communities become places of inclusivity and empowerment where access to menstrual products is a right and not a privilege. In closing, let us not underestimate the power of this small yet impactful change. It's about recognizing the dignity of every person, regardless of gender, economic status, or circumstance. Let's stand on the right side of history and champion this bill, not just for ourselves, but for a fairer and more compassionate environment. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce Lynn. Our final speaker of this public hearing is Helena Hernandez. Thank you, members of the council, for the opportunity to testify on this important bill and resolution. I would also like to thank Councilman, council member Jawando for introducing this critical bill and resolution. My name is Helena Hernandez, and I am the Director of Public Policy at Planned Parenthood of Metropolitan Washington, D.C., otherwise known as PPMW. I'm honored to testify today on behalf of PPMW in support of Bill 4223, the Menstrual Products Access and Equity Act, and the resolution to adopt this bill as a Board of Health regulation. PPMW is one of the oldest and larger, largest providers of sexual and reproductive health care services in the region, offering a range of services such as contraceptives, STI testing, abortion care, gender affirming care, and primary care. We also provide comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care education programming. Um, both externally and internally, PPMW works to ensure our patients, supporters, students, and staff understand menstruation as a natural part of human development, and we work to destigmatize this normal process. Our education team manages PPMW's period project, which provides menstrual products to students who lack access across the region. At PPMW Health Centers, we provide free tampons and pads in our bathrooms for staff, visitors, and patients. The lack of access to menstrual products can cause serious health consequences and inequities. Period inequity creates significant distractions for menstruating people, making them more likely to miss school, work, or other life events, and experience a decline in their mental health. Providing menstrual products in public accommodations, including public restrooms, is critical in equipping all menstruating individuals with access to tampons and sanitary napkins to help alleviate period poverty, inequity, and the stigma that people who cannot afford menstrual products experience in Montgomery County. Already, the state of Maryland has removed the sales tax on menstrual products and is requiring middle schools and high schools to have menstrual products available in female restrooms by 2025 and requires female inmates to have access to menstrual products. The expansion of these efforts in Montgomery County through this bill and resolution will greatly and significantly help menstruating people, especially those who are unhoused and have low incomes. All individuals who menstruate, regardless of their gender identity and gender expression, should be able to access menstrual products in public accommodations and public restrooms in order to lead healthy lives without prohibitive costs. Thank you again for holding this hearing on this critical bill and resolution, and I urge the council to pass this bill and health regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helena. Thank you to all of our speakers today. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. 
We are now going to move on to consideration of the consent calendar. I just wanted to draw attention to colleagues. I sent a memo yesterday to item F, the resolution to amend uh, the updates to the Office of Legislative Oversight's fiscal year 24 work program supplement. Uh, there's an item that I uh, have requested on that. I have had some really good conversations with the uh, leadership in MCPS with the Board of Education. Vice President uh, Lynn Harris was here earlier. I was going to acknowledge her, but uh, we ran a little uh, over, over time. Uh, also with Superintendent uh, McKnight and Carla Silvestri and have had really good conversations with uh, the, the entire Education and Culture Committee at this point. Uh, and uh, just wanted to note this is part of our redoubled efforts to embrace our oversight role uh, and also to work collaboratively, understanding that uh, we have unprecedented needs and finite resources. We talked about that a little bit today with the fiscal update. And I know we share a commitment to ensure that every dollar is put to its best use to serve our greatest needs in MCPS and throughout the county. Uh, this uh, project uh, will uh, allow us to review all the various reports that we have in various different uh, entities and, 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 and requirements at the state and the county and even the federal level to make sure that those reports are communicating with one another so we understand what we have and then do a gap analysis uh, to see what we don't have, what we should have uh, in terms of uh, fulfilling our, uh, our oversight uh, duties to make sure that we're best positioned to utilize uh, all of the information that we have to request additional information that we want and that we need. Uh, it is my expectation that the, this will help us do our job. It will help the Board of Education do their job. It will help MC, MCBS leadership uh, fulfill uh, their role and their job uh, as well. Uh, so I appreciate uh, the, the support of colleagues uh, in that and the collaboration. Just wanted to thank uh, our uh, director, Chris Sealar, and also to Essie McGuire for their work and, and consultation and thoughts uh, throughout this uh, process. I so just wanted to flag that uh, and really appreciate that. And then I did uh, want to note uh, our last item on the consent calendar uh, and our last item uh, for uh, calendar year 2023. Uh, 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 we have um, a need to, uh, to suspend the rules of procedure, Rule 7D, to allow for the introduction and immediate action uh, for item 11P, the final item on the consent calendar, it's a resolution in support of financial assistance to Sodexo Operations LLC uh, through the Maryland Economic Development Authority Administrative Fund. This is a program where the county both has to endorse uh, and also provides uh, a small portion of the uh, total amount uh, that the state is providing uh, for an economic development incentive to uh, an organization. Uh, and so uh, wanted to see if uh, there is a motion uh, to suspend the rules. So move, second. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Uh, so we have now motion to suspend the rules. It is the final item on our consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. We have a motion by Councilmember Lukey. We have a second by Councilmember Katz. All those in favor, final vote of 2023. It is unanimous, see, governing by consensus. Uh, appreciate that, colleagues. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been an honor to be here at this dais for the first time uh, in this capacity, humbled to be able to work together, look forward to 2024, uh, and wishing everybody a happy, healthy, and safe holiday season in the meantime. And with that, we are adjourned. Over 8,000 athletes participated in the Police and Fire World Games in Winnipeg. Diana's deadlift of 330 pounds and bench press of 170 pounds 